Good evening, Demon fans, and welcome back to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy, and the big day is almost upon us. We've waited over 21 years to get another crack of Premiership glory, and it's so close now, you can almost taste that sweet smell of victory. Tonight, we'll take you through our preview of the 2021 AFL Grand Final between our beloved Demons and the Western Bulldogs. We'll take you through the key matchups, some critical players to watch, the strengths and weaknesses of both teams, the coaching styles and game plans, and all of our predictions. It's going to be a massive show that befits the grandeur of the final match on that one day in September. Joining me tonight, long-time Demon Lander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, all Demon Landers. It's been a long season for all of us this year, and we've reached the big dance at last, and so we're going to find out whether we're all a little bit worried or we're really getting excited about what possibly could happen. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it, this week, the nerves have kicked in. I, I was. Uh, people have asked me how last week. How how are your nerves? And I was sort of saying, no, I feel good. But I knew the next week, um, as in this week, the nerves would start kicking in, and they certainly uh, have. Uh, also joining us tonight, once a prolific caller to the show, and now a valued co-host, B Man. Good evening, B Man. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, George. Good evening, Demon Landers. Yes, sir. showing the benefits um, of uh, serial pesting as a caller. Um, wedged my way in here and what a year to have a full um, season on the Demon Land podcast. So uh, I've picked my run perfectly. Might have to get you back uh, next year. Next year, <laughs> next year, renew your contract. Uh, uh, we'll speak to you after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, th- I thought we'd take this opportunity, uh, since you're both here now, uh, to check in with each other, see how everyone is feeling. You've asked me how I was feeling uh, as we head into the last few days before the big dance. How are your nerves? Uh, less than four, day, four days out. Uh, I'll start with you, George. Quietly confident is the uh, term, I think, Ooh. Andy. We're, we've we've proven that we are the best team in the competition this year. We've uh, done everything that uh, we needed to to get here without a hiccup, effect, effectively. And uh, uh, so I'm sure that uh, th- this week will be just another week at the office for the for the side. Big man, how are you feeling uh, about the game? You know, fairly similar to George, but in terms of nerves, I've have not been nervous until um, about five minutes before the uh, Brownlow count. And um, uh, the Brownlow count sort of seems to, you know, signify the start of grand final week, not that I really usually take much interest in either the um, Brownlow or the grand final week. But, um, yeah, I think for the first time on Sunday night, I started feeling nervous and not so much about the, you know, the whether we win, whether we lose, but just that we've got a grand final coming up this week and it's sort of consuming my thoughts. Um, and um, Certainly, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't wait, but also can wait if that makes sense. I sort of nervous about the game. I was quite happy for the two weeks, I reckon. I think I needed that first week just to decompress. It would have felt like it was all too quick. So I know there's been lots of chat about, um, you know, most people seem to be falling on the side of we don't need that buy. But um, personally, I've been pretty happy about it and sort of extended out that feeling, that post, you know, the, the, the post prelim feeling. And uh, um, uh, I, I wonder whether just on that, that discussion, whether people have gone pretty early, it's only a week into it, maybe we want to wait and see what the whole experience is like past the, the game. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm really looking forward to the game. And um, there's nothing that sort of changed my mind in terms of my confidence about how we'll go. So, uh, we'll obviously get into that in the show, but um, yeah, pumped is is probably the best way of thinking. But nervous, but pumped. From a supporter's perspective, I haven't minded the that extra time. I, I think it's given supporters a bit of th- that extra time to soak it all in and enjoy it. Uh, uh, it around my area, there's a lot of houses that have the demons. Uh, colours flying proudly out and I've enjoyed sort of seeing that on my sort of daily walks and 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 the like so I've enjoyed it from that perspective I think time will tell whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and we may never actually know but considering that we had Stephen May who sort of needed that extra time perhaps it's a good thing but I guess if you do have a fit list you might want to just get away with it particularly if the other team 
has some injury concerns, um, it could be your benefit to play it straight away. But look, it's something we'll we'll you'll, you'll we'll never really know. Um, and I, I just wonder what they do uh, in the future. Just a couple of things on that. There's been obviously a fair bit of talk about it, and one of the most common themes that I've heard. I can't begin to say how many play, uh, how many commentators and footy people have made variations on this theme that this is going to advantage uh, the Bulldogs because they had all of that, you know, travel and all of the games in a row. The extra game, of course, having finished fifth, um, that it, you know, that gives Martin an extra week to get fit. It allows Keith to to get um, uh, ready. Similarly for Waitman, so everyone's framing it um, as if it's a massive advantage to them, and even. Um, last night there was, I don't know if you saw it on 360, they Clarkson and Harbwick um, both said much the same thing, that they would much prefer um, uh, not to have the week if they were the um, Ds um, and the, you know, the only reason they're not more bullish on Melbourne is because uh, the advantage that week gives the uh, dogs. But it, I'm really pleased actually that we did get that extra week for a couple of reasons. One of which is that I would have hated if we'd won this game and people went back and said, oh, it was really unfair. They had an advantage over Bulldogs because one thing I hadn't considered actually, I can't, I can't remember if I read it on Demonland or, or somewhere else, was that there would have, one of the reasons for the two-week buy um, was um, the Dogs would have had to have come out on quarantine on the day um, before the um, game. So if it was played last week, one thing, it would have been wet last Saturday, but if it was played last Saturday, the Dogs would have come out of their quarantine hotel the day before. Um, and there was this thought that that would be really unfair on them because we we had a, um, a full week uh, of quarantine at that stage. Um, and so now both teams have had the full, this last week out of quarantine or we'll have this week out of quarantine. So, um, so there's that. I, I really like the thought that if we win this week, there'll be no asterisks attached to it. Like, oh, you know, the dogs were a bit rough. They only, you know, they, they were disadvantaged by that quarantine. And also if we win this week, you know, completely take off the table the fact that they were, you know, burnt out, tired, all of that as, as an excuse is taken away from them. Um, and we know the dog is, Beveridge loves to play on that us versus them stuff. So he would have driven that all week, that narrative. It takes that narrative away from it a bit, I reckon. No doubt. Um, uh, before we get into the preview uh, of, of the grand final portion of the show, perhaps let's have a quick chat about the Brownlow medal night that occurred the other day. Uh, the Demons had their best ever showing on Brownlow night, polling in all 22 matches. It was our highest aggregate ever with six, uh, with 96 votes and Clayton Oliver has polled an MFC record of 31 votes. And for comparison's sake, uh, Wawodin polled 24 votes from 14 wins, Steins 25 from 13 wins, Peter Moore 24 from 9 wins, Brian Wilson uh, 23 votes from 8 wins, uh, Oliver obviously the, the 31 from the 17 and a half uh, wins and sort of when you look at it, Christian Petrarca's 23 votes holds up well against all those um, other, other stars that have won uh, Brownlow medals for the Ds. Um, and then I'll just go in quickly. Uh, the most Brownlow votes by a pair of MSC players under the three-to-one system. Uh, Petraka and Oliver with their thirty-one and twenty-three had fifty-four. Uh, then the next is forty-seven. If you have uh, Oliver and Gorn, the thirty-one and the sixteen votes they got this year. And then the next one was the nineteen eighty-four Brownlow medal count uh, was uh, Peter Moore with twenty-four and Robbie Flower nineteen. So it's a really great showing. Uh, from the D's, um, the aggregate, uh, what, what do you uh, think of uh, of our votes? Uh, personally, I, I really enjoyed the Brownlow this year um, because, you know, it's obviously part of our grand final week. So, um, and, you know, it's incredible when you win that many games, you know that your team's going to poll pretty well because, you um, you know, you have lots of games you're going to get the votes, uh, although that didn't apply to the, the game where we thumped Adelaide, did it? <laughs> How on earth we could have, Keys and Seedman could have got the three and the two in that game, who knows? But um, Well, I do know, I, I 100%, and I said it to you guys the other day when we were talking off air, it's 100% the umpires looked at the uh, stats, saw Seedsman and Keys were the top two uh, stack uh, kick disposal getters, gave it to them. Then oh we need a third oh Bailey Fritch seven goals, <laughs> and so I think it was that they they phoned it in for that one. Convinced. Yeah, 
I mean, just as a general thing, I, as a young fella in the sort of 70s and then the 80s, I used to love the Brownlow because, you know, as a D's fan, we didn't win much. Um, and so in that era, there was a chance of a um, player from one, not a midfielder, and two, it didn't necessarily have to be one of the top teams. Um, you know, so Brian Wilson, I, I don't know, where, where did we finish when Brian Wilson? Uh, we had eight wins that year and it looked like we I had a look today. It, it was probably about uh, ninth, eighth, ninth. Yeah, and I reckon same with Peter there. Moore. Wowie, I think we made the finals that year, maybe. Um, well, Wowie, that was 2000, so yes, we certainly did make the finals. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, of course, yeah. So, you know, Peter Moore... I think we maybe were there and thereabouts for the finals. But so, you know, back then it was something to watch at least to sort of, you know, you'd see some Melbourne highlights, which were pretty thin on the ground anyway. So, but I, I think it's become, a, from my perspective, a bit of a joke and a reward because basically if you're not in the top four team and in a midfield, you're not going to win the Brownlow. And, you know, so you're not going to get a Teasdale winning it or a, you know, you know, or why Woden probably, I mean, he probably fits the bill, I guess. Um, Wilson wouldn't win it. He's a goal kicking forward, sort of a bit of midfield time. So it's become a bit of a bland award, I reckon, but uh, I did enjoy it this year nonetheless. I, I, I sort of uh, agreed uh, along the same lines as Bin, Lan, Bin Man. I think, unfortunately, the Brownlow this year has been severely damaged as an award. Um, I saw some stats today. There's something like 1,200 players in the whole competition and a quarter of the Baranlow votes went to 12 players. Wow. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just not representing the best and fairest players on the ground. There was some, there's been some horrible statistics brought out about individual games like our game against Adelaide. Um, Jack McRae, for example, in his round six game against GWS had 40 disposals eight inside 50, six clearances and a goal and got no votes. Um, there's something I don't think he got a vote, George. In, did he get a vote in that round 19 game against us? Uh, I, I don't know. I was just looking at that as an extra, as yeah. an example. And, and there's been numerous other ones in other <clears throat> uh, other teams and other clubs. Um, and I think that the, the problem is that um, umpires are there to umpire a game and uh, they genuinely only see are called upon to umpire when the contest is in close. When the ball's out and been kicked and marked and run away, they're not calling anything effectively. It's only when they've got to call ball up. So the only people they see is effectively all the people around the ball or the midfielders. And the other thing that uh, one of the other commentators, I don't know, said um, and noted that when people like Greg Williams went on Brownlow, uh, he was being tagged. Um, yeah. So instead of getting 40 possessions, uh, you know, he, sorry, um, these days when you get a Darcy Parish with 40 possessions or Tom Mitchell with 40 possessions, it looks fantastic. But when Greg Williams was getting 40 possessions, he was being tagged. Yeah. Um, it's a lot easier for the mids to get bulk numbers of, of statistics these days. And that's what the umpires are looking at because the umpires aren't looking at, at who's the best player on the ground. They're umpiring the game. So I don't know what they're going to do because I think the danger, the danger, the danger is you're going to have to change the system to make it work more equitably. Um, and I don't know who's going to do that, whether we go to coaches, awards more, uh, more along those lines. But, yeah, I think the Brownlow was um, severely damaged this year. Well, as we, we spoke with... Um, uh Melbourne Football Club CEO Gary Pert and uh, and we'll talk more about that a bit later. Uh, but he mentioned that he was talking to Goody and uh, him and Goody agreed that uh, the coaches' votes are a better indication of the best players in the league. Um, you know, there's certainly a more even spread of votes given to other positions uh, based on coaches knowing that they, you know, gave a task to pay perhaps a particular backman or backman, or you know, um, you know, they knew their forwards uh, or players were under a certain amount of pressure and uh, they performed really well. Um, but uh, of the D's who got votes this year, I was happy to see both Tom McDonald and Jake Lever feature amongst the vote getters for the Demons, particularly T Mac, who at the end of last year was asked to explore his options um, and he's certainly bounced back and we'll talk more about him a bit later on and um, in the preview and he's probably due for another big one. Um, yeah, so I was sort of wrapped with a couple of the Ds that got uh, votes, but yeah, you're right. Uh, 
You made a good point, though, uh, Andy, and uh, to Gary, that um, the the coaches' award pretty much mirrored the top 10, 15 of the Brownlow medal. So that argument actually doesn't hold. Well, that although Maxi Maxi probably was higher than he was in the Brownlow, although he was what he got twenty votes or something. He only uh, sixteen, I think. Sixteen, right? Okay, so arguably he's our most influential player, and he got half the number of votes as uh, Oliver. Um, but yeah, the coaches' award didn't. You know, Oliver won it from Bon and Pelly, didn't he? Wasn't it the? Yeah, because I I asked Gary uh, if we perhaps should. Um, uh, have some type of award. A lot of the people in the media have been sort of asking the question: Should there be an award for the best backman? Because the fo- you know the mid mids have the Brownlow. Uh, you know, there's the Coleman Medal, sort of celebrates the best forwards in the league uh, in the, terms of goals. The Dench Award. Um, sorry. The Dench Award. Yeah. <laughs> the best full back or. Um, and you know, I thought asking Gary Pert being a backman, you know, what his thoughts on it. And he sort of made the point that uh, with Goody that, uh, you know, the coaches votes sort of does that. But I pointed out that even in the top 20 of the coaches votes, there's no backman in there. They're all midfielders and there were two ruckmen, which was uh, Gorney and, and Nick Knack. So, um, yeah, that uh, the coaches vote, while backs do get, uh, do get some acknowledgement in that, they're not getting the 10 votes each week. I think Stephen May did get 10 uh, in one one week, uh, but it's very few and far between. Um, so, yeah, yep. perhaps they backs do need some type of award for recognition. What are we seeing points out in the chat room that Steve May only got one vote and you ask any Melbourne fan, um, you know, he's – he, like, what a phenomenal season he's had. <laughs> all Australian. How can an all Australian get? I saw some graphic where, you know, the six all Australian um, back defenders in the all Australian team collectively got 32 votes or something. <laughs> it's like probably half of them to the, the running halfback well, flankers. Yes. So hmm. <laughs> Steve May only getting one vote. Yeah, it's def- definitely not indicative of, of who's best. One thing I will say about the band, uh, the Brownlow that gets forgotten every year, though, um, and it comes up when it's sort of this discussion about it, not necessarily the um, – the best player doesn't win it, is it's the fairest and best, not the best and fairest. Um, and, and that probably gets missed a bit. But, you know, that's why Lee Matthews never won it um, because he was never the fairest. And so that was fair enough. I, uh, sort of Melbourne, you know, the opposite to that um, is why Robbie didn't win it. But I guess we didn't win enough games of footy, did we, uh, in in his career. So, um, yeah, it's, it's becoming increasingly a bit of a, a sort of a strange award, really. Uh, there's some other Brownlow stats that uh, you guys may not like. Um, the sides to poll Brownlow votes in all 22 home and away games uh, since 1984. So we obviously this year uh, polled in all 22 games. So in 87 Carlton, 89 Hawthorne and 2000 Essendon, they also all received uh, votes in all 22 games and went on to win uh, a, a premiership that year. However... Uh, 2004 Brisbane, 2009 St Kilda, 2010 Geelong, 2011 St Kilda, 2013 Geelong, 2015 Richmond, uh, all received votes in home and away, all home and away games and did not uh, win the premiership. So I just ignored that. He <laughs> said, you know, well, you're not going to like this. I just sort of completely um, vagued out. So. Well, you might not like this one either. The past eight AFL grand finals uh, and 11 of the last 13. Okay, so we'll, yes. we'll say that. Yes. 11 out of the last 13. Answer for here. They ha- have been won by the side, and these are the two grand final teams, have been won by the side that polled fewer Brownlow votes earlier that week uh, in the Brownlow. Um, and this year uh, we've polled 96, Western Bulldogs 85. So statistically it's not on our side. Uh, and B-Man, you've all, all year have been talking about top spot not being the prime spot, but I think, you were talking about that in, in terms of getting to the grand final or actually winning it? Oh, winning it. But, I, you know, I think that, um, as I mentioned, there's all sorts of reason why it's actually, um, you know, been, you know, why the sort of previous 10 years don't count towards this year in terms of all of the differences that have happened. And uh, it was really interesting, Gary Pert making a point how critical it was to finish top because um, it gave us so many... Um, options with the AFL in terms of what we could ask for, one of which was to remain at Joondalup and not move. Um, so finishing top ended up 
a number of benefits flowed from that, not least of which not having the six-day game uh, into the Port uh, Adelaide, even though we would have won that game. But to be able to come, you know, he I thought that was really interesting what he was saying about their planning to, to win that first week in Adelaide and get to Perth straight away, um, set up base. And part of the way that they're able to do that and then stay at Joondalop after winning the um, prelim um, was because we'd finished top and we had some... Um, you know, that was a benefit we were given from finishing top. So um, we wouldn't have had that. It would have been Geelong. Um, maybe Geelong would have picked Joondalop, for instance. Maybe we had first dibs on Joondalop is what how I read the scenario uh, from what he was saying. So, yeah, so I, I think it's worked out brilliantly that we, we finished top. So forget that statistic, Andy. All right. Throw that piece of paper away. <laughs> All right, we'll get uh, we'll get to our preview of the grand final in a moment. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the interview that we did with uh, Gary Pert uh, yesterday, uh, and I thought uh, I'd just plug that interview. Um, uh, it's available for you to listen to now, obviously, uh, after you listen to this podcast. Uh, uh, it should be the episode right before this one in Apple Podcasts or on SoundCloud or whatever Android uh, Google uh, podcast app that you use. Uh, take a listen to that. I might, uh, after this episode, um, for those listening live now, not the ones listening later at home, I, I might put it on if you're listening live. I'll, I'll play it straight after uh, this episode. Uh, live episode so you can have a listen to that otherwise uh you'll catch it on uh the, any podcast app that you uh like to use uh, but i thought i'd get uh from you guys uh to hear your favorite takeaway without too many spoilers uh for those who want to listen uh, about the interview uh, uh george yeah what i really liked about this particular interview was the honesty um that came from gary you know we asked questions off the, off the cuff to a certain extent and um they weren't prepared and he had had the answers there for us and gave us some great insights like Binderman was just talking about the advantages of a finish on top. Uh, my particular interest was, is always in the financial aspects of, of the club to ensure that it's ongoing viability and um, Gary was telling us about the, the membership situation and how COVID affected it uh, this year. You know, we were going along very nicely in close to 55,000 members by about the mid-year and then it stopped. Um, we, otherwise, if we had continued um, on that trajectory, we would have finished up with 60 to 65 they anticipated. Um, the finances came to a grinding halt. We were looking at a $4 million profit potentially and it, basically it'll come down to a break even or just a small profit at the end of this year, which is still good in any case but that's off the back of uh, the further success in the finals. Um, and the other interesting thing for me was uh, the um, uh, insights into the Northern Territory game, which again was uh, killed by the uh, COVID situation. Um, uh, but again, the, the clubs uh, entering negotiations with the Northern Territory government at the AFL, uh, because that brings in about $800,000 a year for us. And uh, maybe uh, he, he let a little cat out of the bag. Maybe we will be doing two games next year up in the Northern Territory. So those were all interesting so sides of things for me. But the indications are that the club's um, doing very nicely off-field as well as on as a result of the, um, the on-field results, but also just the management uh, that's going on as well that's just pointing us in the right direction all the time. And I think it's also important to note he didn't, Say, talk about this, but uh, because we've made the grand final, I imagine our fixture next year will be uh, quite uh, good in terms, not not in terms of we're going to get a harder draw <laughs> based on where we finish, but uh, we'll get, I'm sure, lots of prime time uh, spots. Um, exactly. Yeah. So that's going to be benefit our sponsors and, and the like. So yeah. that's a good thing. Uh, Big man, what did you uh, take away from it? Yeah, I agree, George. That was just his honesty. It was really interesting, but also, yeah, I hadn't really thought thought about that we didn't give him any you know we didn't give him the questions ahead of time and you know so some of them um you know particularly your questions around the finance were, were, were pretty direct and and also your question around the um succession planning for burjo um and so sort of him to answer so honestly and directly i thought was really uh, impressive given you know I guess that's once it's out there, it's out there, isn't it? My main takeaway really was the sort of commitment to the fans is is a real thing, and the fact that he talked about how authentic it is for the players, their engagement, and how real it is, and that um, they haven't had to, you know, 
pressure them or hassle them or to do any of that fan stuff that, that you know they've really been keen to do it and um you know it, it speaks to a really good energy at the club which seems to be just coming from everywhere doesn't it you can feel it it, it feels real um and then the other one was i think it's a really good point um he's talked about it a bit and sort of similar it reminds me a bit of how brendan gale was talking about um the sort of the plan for richmond a few you know before, a couple of years before they started getting going and i guess people looked at him askance a bit with that but um you know the fact that we can be a powerhouse club not just a sort of medium club um and, and i was really thinking about that he's right about that gap of losing sort of you know grandkids or that age and that you know they're working hard and it's interesting that he noted the um, i'd love to say the research they talked about sort of thousands and thousands of missed opportunities but that will come back to the club with this success we're an exciting team to to watch with a team full of players who are really working hard to engage with their fan base with obviously CEO, CEO who's really committed to that aspect of it, um, you know, engagement. So I, when I think, when I afterwards, I was thinking back to the energy in the 2018 finals. You know, those two games at the MCG in a full house and just thumping. You know, so I, I thought after, yeah, there's the chance if we can get on a roll, you know, win or lose this week, we're in a great position to um, be strong for, for the next four, five, six years. And that's where you build a, um, a, a powerful club. Um, and so it <laughs> really got me thinking about Melbourne being a powerhouse again. So, uh, yeah, that was my main uh, or my favourite takeaway from it. Well, that interview is uh, live to listen to. Go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, uh, any of the Android podcasting apps and you can listen to that uh, show. It's labelled Gary Pert interview. Uh, so it's 45 minutes. Uh, so enjoy it. He was, he was really great. He's been, uh, he's been great uh, to our podcast. He's come on three times this year. So uh, that's fantastic engagement. Um so uh, and quite a few uh, I've haven't even asked for it they've sort of approached me to to get him on so I've I've been wrapped with that um we're always happy to have uh, him on all right guys yep and kudos to you too for I mean I I know that they reached out to to you but um I think it's recognition of you know of demon land and all of the uh, of the work you do that they would think to reach out to you and that you're part of their thinking in terms of how to engage with fans so um yeah so kudos thank you all right, let's. Uh, it's match preview time, guys. I still can't believe we're less than uh, four days out from a grand final. It's uh, according to the Demonland uh, countdown uh, at that time of recording. Now it's three hours twenty. No, three days. <laughs> three hours. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, three days, twenty-two hours, sixteen minutes, and nineteen seconds uh, until the first bounce. Uh, so exciting! So let's. Uh, you know, absolutely surreal. Let's do this. We're going to break up the key matchups into different areas of the ground. Uh, we'll start with our defence versus their forwards. George, you're, you're going to begin by taking a, a deep dive into our miserly defence who have been the envy of all the AFL teams this season and have been lauded by the media and the wider AFL community. We come up against the team that had the second highest scoring points uh, for this season, but they'll be missing their leading goal scorer, Josh Bruce. So take it away, uh, George. Yeah, it was an interesting uh, start to this. The, our defence versus their forwards. It's, it's more commonly known as the Brownlow vote free zone. <laughs> yes. Uh, because nobody gets votes in any, either end of the ground. So um, uh, we'll start, talk about this end for a start. Um, and, and as Andy has just mentioned, the, you know, everybody is aware that we've got the stingiest defence in the in the uh, competition, and the Dogs have probably got the best attack in the in the competition, and certainly the they're the number one for inside fifties. Um, but when you really look at those stats, um, the difference over the whole seasons, Melbourne's defence is only three points a game better than the Dogs. The Dogs' offence is only a four points a game better than Melbourne's. So what you've got is two teams that are really, really evenly matched uh, at either end of the ground, uh, and certainly in the, in this area. So. Uh, this this will ultimately lead me to to the conclusion that this game is going to be a lot closer than what people might think. Um, the uh, there's there's not going to be much to to really separate the two the two sides at the end of the day. Interestingly, when you start looking at the individuals um, and how they play in the, at both ends of the ground, the, our defence and their forwards, we'll look at the dogs' forwards for a start. 
Um, they've got Aaron Norton as their major um, forward, uh, who averages uh, about. Uh, he played all to all twenty four games this year. Uh, he averages about one point nine, call it two goals a game, um, and takes about six marks a game. What they're really missing. Uh, at, uh, at this point of the year was uh, Josh Bruce. Josh Bruce is their major goal kicker. Um, he kicked 48 goals um, so far this year, but he, of course, he's out. Uh, he averages 2.4 goals a game. Then the next one that they've plugged in there is Josh Shackey, who barely takes, you know, barely kicks half a goal a game effectively. And I think he's only played eight games in any case in the whole season. So their forward line consists of, at the moment, Norton and a whole stack of smalls um, and occasionally they'll move Tim English up there to try and give a little bit more height because Norton on his own simply can't do the the, the, the work that's required and despite what Shackey was supposed to have done against Alir Alir uh, when they played Port, I don't know that he's going to be capable of doing it against a, a defensive system that the Melbourne have in place. Um, but even against Port, for example, um, English had two marks and no goals. So I don't know what he's contributing. Shackey kicked one goal. Um, but then Port only had those two tall defenders in Jonas and Aaliyah. So it was a lot easier for the for uh, the dogs in Bruce's ab- absence to be able to match up with Port's uh, defenders. We've got the extra defenders, uh, sorry, the extra defenders available. And I think the other major difference is that we, our defenders play a really strong zone defence. So it's not just one on one, or he's better than than the other uh, opponent. It's really a team effort that goes into these guys. So I'm suspecting um, we'll match up a lot better than Port did. The other thing I, I think, when you really look at uh, the Bulldogs' forward line, if Stephen May or Lever take Norton out of that um, uh, uh, contest, who's the next? Uh, Bulldogs player who's going to capable of standing up. They're totally almost defended on these series of uh, small players to be able to score. In fact, um, in the in the last game they played, English and Shaky kicked three goals out of the total of seventeen against Port. So I suspect that uh, Port's uh, sorry that the Dogs' scoring capabilities are going to come from further up the ground. Uh, we've seen it before, the, the way that they operate in waves. We saw it in the Port game where Bailey Smith and Hannon kicked uh, seven goals between them, but they were backed up by the Bontempellis. They were backed up by the Johannessons. They were backed up by, um, uh, I think, McRae got one as well. Um, they totally depend on all these smalls, smalls kicking their big scores to be able to win the games. And what was most interesting was I was watching a, a segment um uh, during the week where Daisy Pierce was commenting on um, uh, how uh, the uh, dogs were able to score so so well and what Melbourne needs to do to stop them. And she basically set, came down to the conclusion, and I think she's absolutely right about this, and I've got a lot of respect for Daisy uh, in her analysis of the game being a, a current player. If there's heaps of pressure on the ball up the ground, that means the dogs don't get to lower their eyes or run into the inside 50 position where they can kick goals. Norton marking or lever marking is the consequence of what happens up the field. It's not what you see. um, uh, People just see a mark having occurred and a goal being scored or a defensive action uh, happening. But the actual work that needs to be done to keep the dogs forward line and their scoring capabilities under check is what's going to happen in the midfield. And I think that's far more critical than worrying about whether um, their two mate forwards are going to kick a goal here or a two there. Um, You've got to stop the guys up the field and making their life a little bit more difficult than what they were um, ran into against Port. So that's a a brief rundown of where I think it's going to be uh, won and lost. And since it's, I'm suggesting it's more the mids. Uh, Bin man's the man who's going to have a look at the mid section very shortly and let us know. Bin man, is there anything you want to add uh, to 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 the forward uh, backs discussion? In terms of how we match up against theirs, yes. um, yeah, yeah. Look, I think that again, it's sort of 
advantage us in a, in a lot of ways that Norton, um, I totally agree with George's point. Um, Bruce is a huge out. And one of the interesting things that, you know, I've heard in the media, well, not heard, is how little discussion there's been about um, the impact of him being out uh, in terms of this game coming up. Because people have, um, you know, I've heard a number of commentators talk about round 11 and round 19 and, um, um, and you know, they're not referencing the fact that Bruce is in, in the side at all. Um, you know, I, I think Norton's a star, but he's a young player player um what they're really missing with bruce is some, and particularly in a big grand final is someone who's strong enough to to create space for norton because norton's a run and jump player um and he needs to he needs to have a good run and jump and he's a, he's got a beautiful set of hands but we've um you know we've minimized his influence in both the games that were played the last game was wet so um you know it wasn't such a um you know it wasn't it was a tricky night for forwards, but uh, he only kicked two goals. There, were, there was that post you put up on um, on Demon Land, Andy, about the Roper, you know, them trying to um, break the tag or, or create a matchup that they liked, which was Lever on Norton and Hannon on May. Um, but you know, it seemed to me that wasn't that influential. Norton only kicked two goals for the game, and Lever still ended up having fifteen um, intercept. Um, possessions in that game so it wasn't as if that was a massive tactical win for them um, you know he's a terrific player Norton the other thing about Norton though um, and a key thing about Bruce not being in there is he's got a shocking technique for kicking for goals and um, I meant to have a look at those numbers but uh, I forgot well, to do his it. stats he's had 86 shots a golf so he's uh, 46 40 uh, doesn't include on the four but he's uh, 46 40 and Bruce was 48 21 so he's had a lot more shots of goal than Josh Bruce, uh, but I think Bruce is a huge out for them, particularly against us. He always kills us, killed us against St Kilda, so I'm happy that he's out. Um, I, I, I'm a bit, a Shaky for me, I, I don't rate him that much, but he's sort of that wild card for me that uh, uh, that I just don't know enough about and could just play out of his skin. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I think that, that, look, to be honest, I think the problem for them, they're going to be struggle to score enough. Um, and that's, you know, I think Bruce is a huge out. Waitman's had a, a good period of time, but we won't give Norton space to jump at the ball. I mean, the, the zone that, um, that uh, George referenced before is all about making sure that there's no space to lead into and that there's multiple players that can come across. So, you know, there's I think there's way too much talk about um, Lever's influence. Um, I don't know whether you guys agree, but he's been manning up and playing a lot more one-on-one. -on -one. And, in fact, he's made quite a few jokes about it that May has been on him about it for weeks. And he's got stronger through the legs. He seems to be competing one-on-one. -on -one. I went back and watched the Round 11 and Round 19 games. He spent a fair bit of time on Norton in the Round 19 game. Um, I think it's totally over um, pumped. Um, you know, I think he's improved one on one, not least because he's got stronger through the through his hips and legs, and uh, I think he's got much more confidence in his knees. So if they end up isolating him on Norton, you know, he can still zone off on Norton. That's the thing. Um, so Norton isn't you know, the problem of of having this focus on Norton is exactly as we're talking about the focus on Dixon for Port. You take him out of the equation, then suddenly the question is, well, where do they get their goals from, mm. um, and how do they bring the ball to ground? So obviously for all forwards now you know that's the the game's changed to a degree in the last five six years it's really as much as anything about bringing the ball to ground um and stopping you know um and then winning it on the ground so you know when it does as it's always the case you know i was thinking through the season that our i guess our achilles heel maybe that's overstating it defensively is our um um, you know, the ground ball gets and, and the opposition mid, small, mediums are uh, the ones who score goal. But that's probably a function of how difficult it is to mark the ball against us. So, um, you know, that's that's who is going to score the goals because the bigs aren't scoring goals. Um, I, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but we're number one by far, the, conceding the least number of marks inside 50, both contested and uncontested by heaps. Um, so it just shows how effective we are. Um, oppositions can't mark it. So it really means that players like, 
you know, Hunter pushing forward, Hannon, Waitman, um, are going to be really critically important for, for the Bulldogs to be able to basically score enough to, to get close to us. Just the other thing about our defensive system, you know, as George noted, we've clearly got the best defensive system in the AFL. The numbers all support that view. Um, but teams, again, I think there's way too much emphasis um, in the media and in the general footy talk about our defence as if it's our only strength. Um, and, you know, teams that are strong defensively historically been thought of as playing boring, you know, low-scoring football. Um, you know, for example, the, the, the one of the best examples in recent sort of years is um, Frio and the Saints under Ross Lyon or the Pies under Malthouse where it was all going down the boundary line and, you know, even in, in much of uh, under Buckley and even, you know, when Ruse came to Melbourne, it was all about keeping the scores low so we weren't getting thumped. Um, but one of the things I love about watching the Ds um, or this um, D's team is when we swarm teams with that, that defensive uh, that intensity and we get that overlap run and the running and waves going from our defence, um, our defence actually becomes a really key part of our offence. Uh, and I think that's not that's there's not nearly enough acknowledgement of how important it is. Um, you know, there's talk about we score from the half back line, but it's not just that. It's not just that we intercept mark. It's that swarming up, um, and I just think it's fantastic to watch. And the, the you know the, the Lions game, second quarter of that Lions game was a terrific example of it, with the defense just swarm them. Um, it just and the other finally thing, the thing about our defense is how critically important it is the forwards and the bids get up and the wingers get up to help out and that's where we win ground ball gets that's where that's our major benefit um and the reason one of the anomalies in round 19 was they scored six goals something or other from um uh inside ground ball gets inside 50 uh, or stoppage clearances inside 50 which is a huge outlier um and i'm convinced a part of that was because we were um still loading and one of the impacts on loading it means your spargos and your nibblers and your cozies and your, your Langdons and, and you know, Gus, they're not able to push up into the forward line, the opposition forward line and crowd it. Um, when we're on, like we were against Geelong, you look around, there's, we've got 17 players inside the opposition 50. We're going to win most of those ground balls. So um, for me, that's a really important part of our defence as well. But yeah, I, I think they're fantastic to watch the defensive um, system that we've got going. The other player uh, that will drift up forward or will be up forward uh, that slightly concerns me is Tim English, just with his height. And he is quite a good kick from goal from close in. So he's one we might need to, to watch too. Um, well, let's uh, move away from that and talk about the battle of the midfields. Uh, B-Man, you've been tasked with comparing the league's two best midfields, uh, including the Winman. I don't envy you in this endeavour. Both engine rooms are formidable. How do they stack up against each other? Who will be minding who? Does Harms take liver? Does Viney get that job? So many questions. Take it away, B-Man. Yeah, it's interesting coming into the round 11 game um, against the, the D's um, Bulldogs round 11 game. All the talk on Demon Land and out in the media and everywhere was how unstoppable the um, um, the the Bulldogs, they just uh, midfield was, and they just come off um, thumping. Was it Saints uh, the week before they um, we played them, uh, and that was the whole narrative for the lead up to that game was the D's aren't going to be able, you know, to um, bat deep enough in the midfield to come close, and heaps of posts on Demon Land saying, you know, if we allow these players to get on top of us, and you know they'll kill us. They, you know, they go so deep. Um, and, you know, they're in, in their mids at that stage. Uh, I think it's pretty much now the same midfield that they've finally been able to get back. So um, Dunkley, Bailey Williams um, sort of comes in and out of there. Obviously, the um, Bailey Smith, is he a winger, half forward? He's sort of really a half forward that plays wing and he really pushes down into the forward line. So I, I reckon... You know, he's a player that cheats a bit, to be honest. He doesn't get back as hard defensively, certainly not as hard as our forwards, but, you know, I think they count him as a winger. Uh, Lockie Hunter, um, you know, now that one of the obviously key differences is they'll have Steph Martin, um, Jack McRae, Bontempelli, um, Dunkley, did I mention Dunkley, and um, uh, Trelaw. Um, so that was, you know, the in round 11, 
the reason why that um, everyone was sort of banging on about how good their midfield was is that they generated almost, you know, 70 or 80%, or I think it was 68% of their scoring from clearances. Um, and as we've talked about, they bring an extra to the clearance um, and they bank on winning the, those clearances. So one of the ways that they, in, in, a, in a way, their midfield is their defense. So unlike us, we we're... We, we, we're able to absorb the ball coming inside our 50, uh, whereas they're not. So they their way of defending it is by keeping it in their midfield and keeping it out of, um, out of the opposition's forward line. Um, and so, I mean, they've definitely got an excellent midfield. Um, I think one of the interesting things about when we compare our midfields is the balance has changed. Um, so now, you know, when we back then... You know, obviously we've got the same midfield with um, Petraka is the starting midfield. Petraka, Viney, um, Maxi, obviously is a huge part of that, um, and um, Oliver. Uh, and I think both Oliver and Track have improved over the last period of time. And I and I definitely think Maxi's had a better second half of the season. So when I match up the two midfields now, um, I see us as having the advantage uh, over them. One of the things that they do is their midfield and. and they generate, as I say, so much of their scoring. It's a problem for them in one respect because you can dismantle it. And as I mentioned, they bring an extra to the stoppage, which means that a player like a Daniels can sit off the, the stoppage and he's the player that plays that quarterback role where the ball gets through those layers. So, you know, key to that is Liberatore. Um, he, he'll get it at the source. Sometimes Bontempelli will get it at the source, gets it out. Um, and with the extra, um, you know, that'll be one of the interesting tactical battles, whether we do bring an extra up. I don't think we will. I don't see why we would change a model that hasn't worked for us. Um, they brought two extras up to that um, um, in round uh, 19 a couple of times. Um, and one of the things Terence, um, when he called in around that game, is that we tagged um, Liberatore both in round 11 and, and less so in 19, but still a bit. And Liberatore brought um, um, harms to the the boundary side to take him out of the equation. Um, and then they had an advantage. They had the extra at the stoppage. Um, I, I think now... At this stage, our model works better for them. We'll back ourselves in. They've been super disciplined. Our midfield is only having one player going to the contest. Um, and we'll often have one player versus two at the contest and back ourselves to win it. When they win it, um, they spread. So it gets out to the Daniels. That gets out to the, um, you know, if it's not Daniels, it's um, the other, not Williams. I always confuse the two. McRae. So, yeah, and McRae, exactly. So often McRae on the on the defensive side of it. Um, so I, I think that's going to be critical. Um, I think they will tag uh, Liberatore. I think they'll bring, you know, it's interesting. I think they'll probably go with Harms. It's worked. Why not? Um, and then allowing um, Viney, who's going to be our ace in the pack. I reckon he's going to be a critically important piece of the puzzle on Saturday night um, because he's going to be a defensive mid that they're going to have to worry about. So he's going to be general all round bulldog basically um so I, I think you know there's a couple of ways they could do that they could run um viney on liberatore at center bounces um and then as soon as it's outside in stoppage um that bring harms up to the contest um so that's an option or they might just run him head to head for the whole game um so i, I think one of the things the keys will be um, stopping that ball getting to the outside, not allowing the, someone like a, um, um, a Daniels to have that outside possession. But we won't. We, we gave up possessions to Daniels in that game. We weren't, we weren't even bothering with him. That's no way that will happen on Saturday night. There's no chance. He was playing Ducks and Drake. So, you know, the other thing that about their midfield is that it's – but sort of all got thrown asunder when um, Trelaw went out. They, they'd lost their rhythm completely in terms of how they looked. And I think part of that was oppositions sort of went to work on their midfield. Really, it's all about, you know, they're number one in the league by miles for handball, average handballs. And that's all about that chaining up. You hear it all the time, the commentators, chaining it away from the contest, winning the contest with the extra. They've got great mids, so they should win their share, sharking off the uh, opposition ruckman, uh, spreading and then and then moving it. But you can disrupt that and you take away one of their major scoring things. And the difference, I think, that's happened, you know, that gives us the sort of real advantage is Max. 
Max is phenomenal, um, and I, I'm positive that you know he's um, they've kept a lot in house in terms of their patterns and setups and structures around the ball. Um, you know that um, we've gone, you know, we scored what hundred plus points, hundred and one points from clearances. That's part of that is just you know it's everything working. Part of that is also because we scored I think fifty something against lines as well. Part of that is also that they're you know they're going to play their best footy at the right time. Um, so I you know round eleven I wouldn't have disagreed that they've got a deeper midfield. They probably still have a deeper midfield. Um, I, I think now um, if you bring the wings in, we talked about, I haven't really talked about but, um, them. I think we're now um, it's definitely an advantage to us, which is a problem for the dogs because that's their one wood. You know their midfield is their one wood. If we're better than that in that space, well, I can't see how they're going to generate enough scoring. You know Langdon is a brilliant runner. I think remember you saying George that um, McRae played on Langdon in round nineteen. Is that? I uh, can't remember. Sorry. No, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think that yeah. like um, they won't. They'll run and they won't tag each other, but they'll run head to head. And I think Gus is a much um, uh, you know underrated player outside of Melbourne. Even now, the sort of people worried about why he's in the midfield now recognise how incredibly important his defensive work is. Um, so I, I think there's real synergy there in our midfield. I think, uh, as I said before, I think a real huge uh, ace in our pack is um, Viney. I, I can just see him going bananas on uh, Saturday and he's, you know, in the heat of battle, um, you know, him and Liberatore will be fantastic to watch. Um, I'm pretty confident they'll they'll put work into Liberatore. Palms probably makes sense um, and deny that ball getting to the outside. That's the weakness in the, in you know, we'll talk a bit later about the weakness, but for me that's their fundamental weakness is their scoring requires those handball chains not to be broken. Massive pressure that will bring um, is, um, you know, kryptonite to that. The more handballs you've got, the more opportunities for that chain to break. So, um, you know, it does promise to be a, a fantastic battle. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see where Steph Martin's at fitness-wise because you can only imagine that Max is going to run him into the ground, wouldn't he? He's going to run him ragged. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned English because, you know, I think he's a poor ruckman and he's a soft forward. So, in a way, he's not quite a li- liability, but he's, he's getting close. So. Well, we do have a caller on the line. Um Good evening, caller. Welcome uh, to the Demon Land podcast. Uh, who are we talking to? Oh, hello. My name's Michael Hintz. Hi, Michael. How are you going? I'm well, thank you. Uh, look, I, I've just come in on uh, come in late on the podcast. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question for the guys, and most enjoyable uh, podcast I've enjoyed all, all year, as have many others. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for your contributions. Um Everybody's talking about Gorn, but um, <clears throat> what about um, Jackson? Because um, Jackson is an unknown, well, almost like another sentiment because he's so good at getting his own ball, so quick uh, beneath his knees. Um, when he comes on, that's, that's a new dynamic, and that frees Max up to go forward or back. Um, the concentration's been on Max, but what about... Um, Jackson and the fact that it's a little like the cricket analogy, fast bowlers bowl well in pairs and Ruckman play well in pairs. Be man, you, your task with the uh, midfield uh, uh, matchups. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it's an excellent point, uh, Michael. I know it's remiss of me not to mention him, actually, because I think you're 100% spot on is from a, um, one, just his skill set's unique and his ability to win ground balls um, is phenomenal for someone who's player. So, as you say, it almost creates an extra midfielder. Um, but I, I think the the real benefit or one of the real benefits of him is exactly, as you as suggest, the tactical flexibility it gives us because it means that, you know, sometimes that's framed negatively on, you know, by people, you know, Max is struggling. And so you bring um, Jackson into the ruck and he does better at the um, at, in the ruck. But I think it's that's not the case at all. It's it's about it exactly as you say, the, um, the flexibility tactically to, to um, have Max push back if need be. He ended up on Hawkins quite often um, last week. He's another player that can get in that hole in front of Norton. Um, 
push forward as we he scored five goals last week. Two of them for genuine forward uh, half uh, goals, weren't they, in terms of the one big mark that he took and then taking out of the ruck. Um, it also means that they can use him um, more aggressively as a ruckman inside 50 when you've got Jackson, which he's been doing, which he did against Geelong in the round 23 game. He took a lot of inside 50 rucks. So I think it's an excellent point, Michael, in terms of of how it enables Max to um, to 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 bring different things and and put himself on the ground wherever he wants and it was really interesting earlier in the season Maxie saying that they don't pre-plan that um and it's um you know no doubt they've got key strategies around it but they make the decision on the field between the two of them when they're going to go into the ruck and when they're going to swap I'm, I'm sure there's a there's some strategy from the coaching around that but uh you're right he's he's really important um and even when he's not getting high numbers I think he's really important from basically what it allows Max to do. And, and, you know, Max is so clever. He's not just a good footballer. He's a smart footballer. And he knows where to put himself and how to um, take advantage of, of the, you know, the height he's got. And, you know, it must be so frustrating for the opposition to look up and see Maxi down the line. And part of that is, the, is what um, uh, Jackson allows him to do. Yeah, thank you, Binman. And the other thing is it's a different dynamic for English and, um, and Martin to come up and the ruck against uh, Jackson because they're going to have to do a bit of chasing. It's going to be hard for them to keep up with Jackson's athleticism. Yeah, and he's been... I mean, the other thing about Jackson is he's been marking better in the last three, four weeks, hasn't he? So he's been clunking his marks and he's the sort of player that... You know, seems to love the big game experience. And he's the sort of guy you could see really having a huge game out of the blue where he kicks four or five goals and um, they're all bonus goals. So uh, you're right, though. I mean, he's aerobically going to challenge both of them together. Uh, you know, English is not really a, a sort of a ruckman and he's not really a forward. Um, but, and Steph Martin looked unfit last week, so everyone's talking about his game, but he didn't get really high numbers. So Maxi will run him into the ground, as will Jackson. And one final comment, if I may, harkening back to uh, last week, was um, I think the importance of Viney in that first quarter, um, everybody talks about the results, you know, Maxi's goals and Oliver and Petrarca, that was terrific. But the way Viney has changed his whole game from trying to get the ball and bullock through to getting the ball out with uh, smart handballs and getting that link and being the engine room, lowering his eyes and delivering it with accuracy... That's a part uh, we haven't seen from uh, <clears throat> Viney for quite a while. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, totally, totally agree as well. <laughs> I, I think he's completely changed his game and is becoming far more and to, to his great credit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, to his great yeah. credit too. Yeah, um, but I think the the overall result is, you know, he was playing fantastic football before this, is that it's benefiting the team a lot more. Um, he, he's now complimenting yeah, the other two in the middle. You're right, George. And what yep. though he hasn't sacrificed any of his you know, tackling or defensive intensity or the fear he must put in opposition players. Uh, I think Demon Trucker, when he called in last week, you know, made that same point that he's lowering his eyes, you know, as you're pointing out, Michael, and, um, uh, you know, his inside 50 kicks are a lot more damaging. And, um, you know, and now that I think of it, he hasn't really sort of had that situation where he's taken on the extra tackler and got pinged in the last couple of weeks. And, um, yeah, he, he's super important and he's going to be super important on Saturday. And, again, for me, it's that question about this funny narrative all year about Melbourne. And maybe it's because our one woods, our defensive um, system and our, how good we are at defence. But it seems like when we, whoever we play, they pump up an element of the opposition. Um, and so, you know, when we were doing this exercise, looking at the various area of the grounds, is they got to worry about our midfield. You know, they've got to worry about how are they going to stop Viney? How are they going to stop Petrarca? How are they going to stop Maxi's influence? He's kicking goals. How are they going to stop, you know, Oliver? What, what's, what are their strategies to combat that? Um, and, you know, everyone talks, you know, about how good their midfield is. Our midfield's better, I think, now. I wouldn't have said that in the middle of the season, as I was saying before, but I do, I, I think so now. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, great show. Most enjoyable, and please do keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for calling, and thank you for your uh, kind words about uh, the podcast. Thank you. 
That was uh, Michael, and we did have another caller call in uh, while Michael was on the line, but I, d- I didn't want to answer because it can sometimes kick off uh, the current caller. So, uh, caller, if you are still listening, uh, give us a call back and uh, we'll get you on uh, when we can. Um, uh, so, we'll move on from the midfield. Um, you know, just before let, we do, yep. Andy, I just wanted to ask George a question about midfield. They haven't really done it so far. They did in the first few games. Can you see them sort of as a complete change because they haven't been doing it, bringing Cozzy into the um, centre bounce for the first bounce again, George? Um, I don't I don't think we will. Um, I think uh, when we were seeing Cozzy play there, we might in the future, but... Uh, in, not, not, but not in the grand final. I think we might see him develop it like a Cyril Rioli type of role, used as a shock troop every now and again. Um, I don't think there's any reason to change anything in the middle. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's very important, ret- ret- keeping the continuity. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that's happened in the last couple of weeks is that uh, Sparrow has now stepped up as well. Um, when Cozzy was in the middle, Sparrow wasn't even in the side and we were having to use Harms in there occasionally and we were using Jordan in there and um, uh, I think we are even using Gus in there occasionally. Our midfield's now really solid. You know, that Viney, Oliver, Petrarca team in there is, is um, quite set in concrete and now Sparrow becomes in as the first um, option. So um, yeah. I, I doubt that we'll see it, but we may well in the future um, as, yeah. as, a, like, as a shock troop occasionally. But Yeah, I agree. And, I mean, he's not – the thing I love about Goody is he's not really – he's not playing games, is he? This is no. how – you know, it's not like he's going to do a beverage and everyone loves beverages magic. You know, It's not – you know, Goody will do some tactical stuff. There's no question about that. But he's, he's not, you know, going to do it for the sake of – doing something different. The other thing, just quickly, sorry, Andy, just really quickly, the I think the big difference between our midfield now and theirs now is that we're getting goal side when we get out of contests. They're still getting a lot of their... Um, and when they when they win their contests at the uh, stoppages, they feed it out. It often goes to the defensive side and then they have to mm. kick it from the defensive side. We're winning our contests now as we did against Geelong and when we get it, we get out the front and we've got our bulls that are standing up and not getting tackled and we're running ahead of the ball that you know the goal that you've got on demon land and you have maxi that's a beautiful kick obviously but it all comes from the way that track gets through the contest and you've got multiple players running forward of the ball to receive it that's super aggressive um and much more damaging than the bulldogs method i think that also might be a um Another reason why we won't see Cozzy in the middle as much because when we're exiting from the front of the uh, circle, having Cozzy in the forward line is far yeah. more dangerous than and, having and him in the middle. strong enough, is he, to get through those tackles? No, 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 yeah. no. We do have another caller on the line. Um, uh, welcome to the Demon Land podcast. Uh, who are we talking to? Oh, hello. It's uh, Peter here, alias Jumping Jack Clement. Um, I um, I really enjoy your podcast and I'm very grateful for the work you bucks put in. I usually listen to it when I'm going for a jog. Uh, but tonight I'm listening live because I'm so excited about the, the grand final. But um, I've, I used to be obsessed with kick-ins, but now I'm obsessed with uh, the Western Bulldogs and the umpiring. Ooh, and um, my favorite I topic. was shocked and disappointed to see that Sterick's been appointed he was part of that egregious performance in 2016 when the umpires gifted the premiership to Footscray and it worries me that they might do it again and, and I'm slightly disappointed that only one of the three umpires that did the um, Melbourne Geelong game at the hoot they did very very well in that game only um, Mollison was appointed for this match I'd be interested in your opinions on that um, well, the uh, well, it's a well-known fact that this year the Bulldogs have had um, or more than 100 more free kicks uh, to their advantage than we have. I think we were negative 15 or something or 15 or 20 there, plus 80. Um, they didn't get the rub of the green in the game against uh, Port, which two of the umpires who were umpiring in the grand final umpired. Uh, but for most of the year they have had the rub of the green. Um, I wanted to see if anyone had any stats on 
uh, the umpires that are playing, uh, umpires that are officiating this week and what their statistics are in games with the Ds and games with the uh, Bulldogs. But unfortunately, no one had those statistics and I don't think the AFL makes those available for obvious reasons. Uh, guys, what are your... Uh, uh, George, maybe start with you. Do you have any opinions on the umpires that are officiating this weekend? Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with the ones we've got there. Stevic is the best umpire in the league. Uh, Rosebury's not far behind him. Um, Mollison, it's his first first crack at it, but I'd much rather those three than there's a couple of other umpires who um, are a bit dodgy, I suppose, <laughs> in, in some of their decisions, as, and that's all you can say. Um, they're just not as good as these guys. Um, I, I was pleased, as Andy's pointed out, in that in that Port versus Dogs game, that Port got uh, more free kicks than than the, than the Dogs, um, even though the Dogs won the game. Um, I think the message might have got through from AFL House about the inequities that are occurring, but when you get two, uh, certainly two good umpires and three good umpires, you'll see less of um, less of that problem that. Um, uh, we've seen before. The other thing is, you've got to admire the bulldogs. They get inside. They get underneath. Um, uh, when you're when you're when you're first to the ball, you will you will get calls uh, more in your favour. But we've got a completely different side than what we had, you know, even two years ago. Um, we're going to be the ones underneath and getting the ball out more often than than, than they do. I suspect. It's, um, but I don't think that holds water. What you said about if you get in first, you. Um, you get more freeze, but they get more freeze even when they have less possessions. For example, in round 19, we had, uh, I think, 30 more possessions, but 14 less free kicks. So it would have been, if it was equal, it would have been even greater discrepancy. We must have been in front and getting the ball if we had more possessions. Not not necessarily these days. There's Geelong would be the classic example about teams that get lots of possessions but don't actually get in and get the ball that much. You can kick the ball all around the, around the ground all day and uh, never be in the position of, of actually a contest. What That's I'd not say, how we do it. What, I, what I'd say was great to have. I thought the Brisbane-Melbourne game and the, um, the, the prelim were both umpired super well and it makes such a difference to the game. Um, yes. It just makes such a difference. One, one thing I will say, though, is that I, I heard, I, maybe it was you, George, I can't recall, that the idea that some teams actually don't mind giving away frees um, and Melbourne being one of them because um, what it allows you to do is stop the game and set up behind it. So we, uh, it's something that I've noticed this year in particular is that we have this funny, we go fast often, but often we'll, we, we'll stop and we stop to wait um, to set up ahead of the ball. We don't, if there's nothing forward of the ball, we stop. And that free kicks can sometimes have the same um, effect because the game stops. You get a stop, you get a free kick, everyone stops, a man on the mark, and then everyone, we can set up our zone. Um, so the, I think the sort of example was used by Richmond similarly because then they, it, it, the, it works well for when the game stops. And um, for the dogs, but sort of the, the um, opposite to that is that they want the ball in motion. They want the ball flipping around. Um, and if there is a stoppage, that's stopped. So it's not always like it was in, you're right, round 19 game, 25-11 was ridiculous. And there was no question in my mind that was a factor in the result. But, it, you know, if it's relatively even, sometimes it's not as big an advantage to, to win on the free kick count as it, as it would first seem, I think. Good point. Thank you. Thanks for taking my call. Not Keep a, up the great work. I really enjoy it. Not a problem. Thank you for your kind words. And, uh, yeah, uh, we'll move it move it on now. Um, he's been a long-time Demonland poster, I believe, uh, jumping Jack Clement. Clement. So uh, thank you for the call. We'll move on, uh, boys. Um, now... Our forwards versus their backs. Our forward line has been formidable this season with multiple avenues towards goals. Uh, you might stop one of them, but then another one pops up. George, how do you see the matchups in our forward line? Yeah, once again, this is another Brownlow vote free zone. Um, forwards and, and defenders don't get the credit they deserve, uh, as we've seen. Um, we've got a completely different setup. Um, uh, and and uh, the Bulldogs have got a completely different setup from what we're seeing at the other end of the ground. Um, we've got our two talls in T Mac and um, 
uh, Brown, uh, whereas the Bulldogs at, at the other end have got Norton and a couple of um, uh, ring-ins, for want of a better word. What, what the Bulldogs don't have is the people who are surrounding our talls, and I think this is one of the other um, big positives that, w- that we've got. Um, we've had Bailey Fritch, who's kicked 53 goals this year. There's, there is no equivalent on the, in the Bulldog side um, in terms of output um, for, what, for a, a person who's not a, considered to be one of the talls um, up forward. Uh, T-Max kicked 31 goals. Uh, uh, ben Brown's kicked 22 in only 12 games. Um, but also we've got this bloke called Pickett, um, who has kicked 40 goals this year. Um, once again, they don't have an equivalent. They t- they depend on their running mids and their um, people moving up the ground, whereas we've got a more traditional type of forward line, and our guys are, are score our forward line is scoring goals, um, which um, the Bulldogs certainly don't in in comparison down the other end. So the 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 question is. Um, while the Bulldogs have got some very good defenders, individually they're very good. You know, Alex Keith and Easton Wood, um, they're going to have some decisions about uh, Cordy and Gardner as about whether they um, keep them in and who, who goes out because Keith is obviously going to come back into the side. So they've got matchups for us uh, as far as the tools are concerned. But who are, who are they going to put on Pickett and, and Fritch? Maybe they can put Duray on, maybe Bailey Dale, but really are they going to... Be, I don't know that there's anybody really in their side who's capable of holding Pickett um, down for the game. Um, and then we don't don't need to forget about Charlie Spargo. Um, uh, where does he fit into it? He just has this habit of popping up every now and again during the game and creating space and creating goal opportunities for all these other players. The Bulldogs' defence is, is basically, as, as Binman had said uh, earlier, uh, their defence is about stopping the ball getting down to the opposition's forward line in the middle of the ground. Um, so uh, as they stand, they don't have the same sort of level of structures uh, that that we do. Um, they're a lot more about the individual efforts and hoping that they can beat an individual player. Uh, the other player who's critical to their whole structure, less so from the defensive side, is, is Caleb Daniel. Um, he's he's an equivalent to our Salem um, in terms of driving the attack forward, getting the ball out of their defensive zones because he's got such great vision and great football IQ. But again, as we talked about at the other end of the ground, um, it's all about pressure. Now in the in the round eleven ga- round eleven game where we won, um, there was intense pressure board on Caleb Daniel, and I think you can pick up during the game. Uh, very early, our chances of whiz- winning will be around Caleb Daniel. If he's kicking the ball sideways instead of down or cutting through the through the uh, zone, if he's kicking it sideways because he's got nowhere to go, we're going to win the grand final. Uh, it's that critical to their ball movement to be able to move the ball up to the other end of the ground. Um, but again, it's it's what our what our our midfielders and uh, you know the wingers coming back to to um, uh, cut out these players is very critical um, uh, for the end result at the end of the day. Finally, again, comparing the round 11 and the round 19 games, round 19, we kicked nine goals, 11. They kicked 13, seven. Both kicked 20, you know, 20 shots at goal or thereabouts, uh, but they win the game. In round, in round 11, we kicked 13, nine. They kicked eight, eight, 11. 21 shots to 21, and we win the game by 28 points. If we kick straight early on, it's game over as, as well. They they won't they simply won't be able to kick enough goals to be able to get in front of us. If we're kicking straight, getting the six pointers, uh, they just won't be able to get get their noses in front or, or get the enthusiasm. We'll just keep keep running them over them slowly. So, two completely different sort of uh, uh, defensive structures. Um, uh, I think I think our forwards will do do enough. I think they're going to struggle with the height of Ben Brown. I think they're going to struggle with the mobility of of uh, T Mac. Um, and I think uh, enough pressure can be brought on uh, Caleb Daniel in particular to be able to shut down his um, ability to move the ball uh, up the ground uh, when they need it to to happen. Yeah, that, that's uh, it's a bit. <laughs> 
the narrative that I was saying before about how it seemingly our you know our things like our forward line are constantly underrated, like um, King talking about Geelong having a forward line to die die for ahead of the um, of the prelim. I think it's just it, it's a. I reckon Goody must love it. Goody must love the fact that our forward line is hardly ever talked about as a threat that needs to be quelled. Um, in the six games since the since the dog beat us, um, so we've won six obviously since then. Uh, so since round nineteen, we've averaged one hundred and um, one hundred point five points per game. Um, that's padded a bit by the fact that we tailed up the Suns and the Crows, um, but um, it's also sort of balanced a bit by the fact that three of them were against top four teams, twice against um, the Cats, once down at. Um, uh, uh, Cadinia Park, of course, uh, and then the Lions. In the, in the seven games that the Dogs have played since that game, they've only averaged, well, only, they've averaged 81.5 points per game. Um, that's a big gap. I mean, you know, they've had it padded as well. Like they, I, I thought Port were woeful um, and, you know, they got it, they jumped the, um, Port, but they had Adelaide and, uh, sorry, not Adelaide, Essendon in the first final. And um, so that's a big gap. Um, we're uh, far and away the most potent team in the AFL in the last two months of football. Um, and yet the focus is on what we're going to do about Norton. I mean, exactly as I say, George, what are they going to do about Brown? What are they going to do about Cozzy? What are they going to do about, you know, McDonald if he gets off the chain? As Michael points out, what, what happens with Maxi pushing forward or Jackson? You know, it, I, I just think Goody must love it. You know, it's sort of we're the team who's more likely to score um, over 100 points, as I said. You know, the last six games of footy, it's all about, you know, peaking at the right time, and that's what we're doing. We're scoring, you know, just as we did in the first six um, rounds of the season, averaging over 100.5 at the right end of the season, uh, over 100, I should say, at the right end of the season, we're averaging over 100. And just the other thing, George, is right about the pressure. The big difference between our forward line and their forward um, line, well, their, def- their efforts to defend us, is that their forwards don't push up into their back line. Um, so someone like Bailey Smith, you know, he, he'll be up there at different times, but he's not pushing up there like Aspargo is. Um, and so that makes it really hard for them, as you as you say, when the ball hits the deck inside our forward line because the, their system doesn't re- have enough of those players who can push up. And it's not as simple as, as saying, well, okay, well, for this game they will. If they haven't got the running patterns and the fitness to be able to, like, you know, Aspargo and Nibbler, to run all day up, and um, uh, even someone like Fritter does it as well, to run up and down the ground all day and to push into the opposition's defence and then get back into our forward line is, you know, that's a hardcore way of playing footy. And so it's not like the dogs can suddenly turn that on. Um, and, and I think, again, that's a sort of a problem for them in their ability to stop us scoring because they don't get back hard enough. Um, someone like Bailey Smith, he's, as, as I meant before, he cheats. He gets, you know, he looks great. He'll get his goals, but he pushes head of the ball uh, and doesn't work back as uh, hard defensively as now even sort of our mids do as well. we got another caller on the line. Uh, welcome to the Demonland Podcast. Uh, who are we talking to? Oh, hello, Andy, George and Binman. It's D Zephyr. Hey, hey D Zephyr, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. good uh, yeah, I'll keep this short. Seems like you've got a full board of calls tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it, Oh, great show, by the way, tonight. Just wanted to talk about a player I haven't seen much discussion about lately, and I think his last few weeks have been really good, and his prelim bustle was outstanding. Um, and that's Christian Salem. Um, I think the general or the broader footy public kind of underappreciates how good a footballer this guy is. And, and what I noticed from the prelim was that he pushed forward of centre a lot, and when Binman's talking about weapons and worrying about the dogs' weapons, I just thought, oh, how dangerous is it to have Salem delivering the ball inside 50, as we saw in the prelim, uh, with his vision and his death kicking? Um, I don't know if that was by design or just the way the game flowed in the prelim, but gee, if it's a pressure cooker environment in that grand final on Saturday, uh, I'm thinking Salem's in for a huge game. Just wanted to get your thoughts on how you've been travelling these two finals games. I'll, I'll, I'll start if you like, uh, since we were, we were going to talk about him a little bit later on, but, um, yeah, I, I love Salem. I love love the way he plays. He's one of these high IQ football players who, uh, no matter what happens in the game, he always seems to have plenty of time to be able to manoeuvre, and he's just his kicking ability is, is just elite. Um, 
he is so dangerous. And I, I think um, he was able to exhibit um, his best in the pre- in the preliminary final um, simply because he had a rest. If you recall, towards the end of the season, he was uh, a bit doubtful with his groins. I think they were talking about um, as to. He just looked tired towards the uh, later end of the season, and particularly in that round nine, around that round nineteen period. But that break that he's had, I think, has made a huge difference. And even they were saying uh, last week on the training track, um, oh, we've noticed Salem walking around the boundary line. I can't remember who it was, maybe Tom McDonald, and he said, "Oh yeah, well, Salo is always um, a bit bit sore on the Monday." Um, but, yeah, so I think the rest has done him a huge uh, service and I think we'll see a similar sort of thing come the grand final. Um, he's got all the skills. He's, he's at that elite elite level and uh, if he's delivering from the back line, once again, the dogs have got real troubles trying to counter him. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's interesting because I think he's a victim of his own sort of success in a way, isn't he? He's like so many yep. of our players, but it's a really good point, DZ. He, sort of the way he goes about it, he's not flash in the sense, and he and he gets compared to Daniel a lot, but I reckon they play a different um, role. Like he doesn't sit off the, the contest the way Daniel does. Um, he plays a, almost a true half back. but what he does do that's similar to Daniel is that, and what we're so good at doing, is trapping the ball in our front half and how often he was in the prelim and also against the Lions. You know, he's a, how is it when the opposition are dump kicking it under pressure, and it's exactly as you're saying, George, it's all about that pressure. You get your first go, you hope to score on the way in, but if you don't, if they dump kick it out, and so often it ends up with him, um, like that kick that he kicked um, in the first quarter into um, Spargo. You know, he, he makes good decisions under pressure. I love the way he kicks. He doesn't try too much. He, he kicks with, and so he's similar in that way to Daniel. But I think they actually play a, a different game, and it's a much, he's much harder to take out of the game, I reckon, than Daniel. Because with Daniel, all they need to do, you know, is to, well, not all, but if, if they limit his ability to get that um, handball uh, release from the um, clearance if, when they win it, um, that takes a big one of one of his weapons away but they can't really do that against Salem they can't because he it's not he he doesn't sit off the contest and get easy kicks out the back that he he goes forward so um yeah he's super important and I love how he push it like the whole back line pushes up high rivers as well and um Salem and um you know he's he's also sort of he's got that low center of gravity where he you know he doesn't seem to be able to get knocked off the ball often um and you know even when he has to kick on his right he seems to be able to hit targets even if it's a 15 20 meter kick DZ for anything else? Um, no, but I think you touched. I was going to ask the question about Daniel, um, but you touched on it earlier whether we were going to get someone to sit on him, maybe. Because I did uh, hear Harms in an interview last week say he predominantly played half forward the past few weeks. And with Viney maybe tagging Libba and mentioned earlier that maybe when the ball gets out of the centre, Harms will run to him. So I was just wondering whether I would do that if harm started half forward, but um, I think you guys answered that earlier. And we're going to be talking about Caleb Daniel in a minute uh, where sort of if all of us have taken a couple of players to sort of look at and he's one of them. So we will talk about Daniel uh, very shortly. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, D Zephyr, for your call. And, uh, yeah, go Demons. Go Dees. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Cheers, D Zephyr. That was uh, D Zephyr, also a long time Demon Lander. It's good to hear uh, some voices uh, of uh, long time uh, people from uh, the website. Uh, all right, let's um, let's go on to our critical players. George, you've already talked about Christian Salem. We're, we're, we're going to highlight uh, a couple of critical critical players, each one from each uh, team, and we've sort of steered away from the obvious stars like Max, Clary, Track, uh, the Bont. Actually, uh, B Man, did you talk about the Bont? When you'll talk about their midfield, I, I don't recall his name coming up because he is a weapon for them. I know there's that uh, injury cloud that he's under. Um, are you concerned about him? He's the type of guy that could break havoc and, and uh, you know, win a Norm I, I Smith mean, medal. I mentioned him but really didn't drill down. But, I mean, he's – he obviously, he's a weapon. He's a, he's a fantastic footballer. Um, yeah, I, I reckon he's injured, though. 
So I'm not saying that he won't have a big game, but he looked he he didn't look right in um, the Port game. I mean, for a team that won by what 80 points or something, I think he only had 15 possessions or or something like that. He didn't look to be running freely. I guess he's got two weeks to um, to come good. But I suspect that you know the talk has been, hasn't it, that he's been carrying an injury for some time. So I I would not be surprised in the wash up of this season um, that you know it is revealed that he was carrying something for a while because even the Brownlow talk about the Brownlow, he, you know, I know that they were losing games in that last part of the season, um, but he dropped off in terms of um, it getting votes. Definitely a weapon. You know, it's a bit like, do you put time into him? Probably, you know, you're aware of, of what you need to do with him, but, you know, the, I, they won't tag him. Um, they'll look to limit his influence. Um, how, how you do that is to win clearances and win contested ball. Because he can definitely hit the scoreboard as well. Uh, if yeah, he is fully yeah. fit, he's, he's he's one that can kick three goals in a match. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll 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 move on, but we're not uh, sort of highlighting the the outright stars of the team. Um, B man, you uh, you'll be covering the crafty de- defender with the elite kick, Caleb Daniel, um, who D Zephyr wanted to inquire about. So uh, and you're also our intercept king, Jake Lever. So take it away. Yeah, Caleb Daniel, terrific player, one of my favourite non-Melbourne players. Um, in large part, I just love how he kicks. I reckon he's the best kick in the AFL, not the longest, um, but, um, you know, he's incredibly accurate. Um, he, um, you know, I, I looked at some of his stats and was actually a bit surprised. He ranks 17th in total rebound 50s. I was surprised. I thought maybe he'd be higher, but, you know, I guess that's not too bad. 14th in total effective disposal. So, um, again, I, you know, I was thinking he might be higher. Uh, in that one, one of the stats was interesting, um, and I think it's important in, in how you stop him. Is he's eleventh in total bounces, so he gets the ball when he runs into space, and that's where he's a bit different to Salem. Salem doesn't do that so much. Um, in terms of comparing him to Salem, actually, because they're often compared, um, it, it's interesting. Caleb Daniel was eighty; he averages eighty percent, um, just a tick over eighty percent um, time on ground, whereas um, Salo's up around um, eighty six. So that you know that doesn't sound huge amount, but that's a fair fairly big difference. Obviously, you know, um, he's on the bench quite a bit. Um, so, um, Daniels, I, you know, he's really critical um, for them. There's no question about that. Um, I think that what George said before is really important is that obviously he's, he's super important to how they transition the ball um, and it gets, you know, people hate it, but that sort of quarterback role where he sets it up. I think an element of his game that's underrated is that um, under pressure uh, in defence, he's so reliable. This is where he is similar to Salem, is that he hits targets uh, under pressure to take the pressure off. So when, you know, they're under the pump down back, his ability to um, chisel a little 40, you know, a 25 metre kick uh, and relieve the pressure because they can mark the ball and stop it and, and you know, um, repel that attack is really important for them. Um, you know, I think that the a sort of strength of his is his ability to transition the ball. That bouncing thing, I think, is interesting because he, he he's given a lot of space. Um, so, you know, that's the weakness to that. And as I was saying before, he sits off a lot of contests um, and a lot of stoppages. So he's that player who, you know, they want to get the ball out to him and McRae and um, if Bontempelli is not at the coalface to Bontempelli, but Daniel's super important, you know, makes great decisions, um, you know, all of those sorts of things around how he plays. I think the key to, to him is how they, they've they played Tui uh, and the t- tw- the, both times we played Rich, um, which is really about focusing on applying pressure to him. And, and that's what George was saying before. So every time he gets the ball, him under heaps of pressure. And if you go back to round 11, that's exactly what ha- um, happened. So just give him no time. Um, and as important as that is making sure that he hasn't got that opportunity to run and bounce. So not allowing them spaced, uh, him space to run into and that's exactly how they um, managed um, to uh, to his influence and uh, in the prelim uh, and rich by you know being really super focused all the forwards so no one tagging him as such but everyone having a focus on getting across the Daniel buzzing making sure that every time he gets any disposal it's under um, pressure so that's number one and number two is that he's got no space to run into so when he looks up he's got to get rid of the ball he can't balance and carry for 25 metres that's when he's most dangerous um, the D's are brilliant at pressing up as I was saying before it's a huge part of how we play footy we win that ball back we trap it forward um, and so I think that'll be key to, to um, 
doing two things, stopping them transition the ball. Um, and one of the things that they're really, it's interesting is that I was super surprised to read that they were 15th at round 19 in terms of ball movement. And that talks about transitioning from the back half of the forward half. I would have thought they were much better. But as George said, that's all about winning it in the middle and bringing it forward as opposed to moving it from the back half. They're 18th now. So they've gone backwards in that time. Um, but, you know, their ability to transition is so not as good as what I thought it was. Um, but key to their transition game is Daniel. So I think we take that away from him, make sure that he's not getting easy handballs um, outside those stoppages uh, and we'll go a long way to negating his influence. And, again, sort of strength to take him out of the game. There's no real equivalent. If you did that, um, you're not damaging him. In the, you're not. It's not hurting us in the same way that it would be if we can stop Daniels in that way. Um, and um, uh, Jake Lever? Oh, so yeah, Jake Lever, I mean, what can you say? He's, um, you know, had an incredible season. Probably some of the stats, <laughs> everyone's well aware he's had more intercept um, marks than anyone in the history of the game. Um, he's um, ranked first in total intercepts, which is no surprise to anyone. He's uh, This is a really interesting one, I thought, and much sort of maybe, again, he's a bit underrated, which is amazing to think, but he's ranked, he's obviously all Australian, ranked six in total one percenters this year. Um, this was really interesting to me when I was looking at his numbers. He's ranked second in time on ground percentage per game, which um, is phenomenal, really, for a player who isn't, uh, like, who does as much running as he does when he's intercepted. Um, he's um, obviously number one in intercepts per game. He's ranked eighth in total contested marks. And that goes to my point about um, I think he's underrated his ability one-on-one. -on -one. And certainly I was critical of him one-on-one -on -one last year. I think he's improved heaps. But eighth in contested marks is really high. Um, I don't actually – I didn't look. I don't know where Maisie is on that. Um, but, you know, that speaks to a player who is in brilliant form this year. Um, and the problem, I reckon, is, is sort of related to that is that I just think there's way too much emphasis on stopping Lever. Um, you know, they played all of that ring around the Rosie that it was, you know, noted in that clip of trying to get um, Lever on Norton to try to, you know, somehow, I guess, the, the logic must have been that, you know, he's not so good one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, he's still got 15 intercepts in that game. So, um, you know, it seems to me that's a bit of a, a dead end um, trying to sort of minimise him. He's super important also, I think, May as well from a leadership perspective. You know, it's sort of all that talking and, you know, that round 11 game, everyone was noting it about, you know, the structure. But he, he's been a real um, brilliant um, for the club from a leadership perspective, but also managing that back half uh, about where everyone's supposed to go. Um, he's got more confident with his marking, it seems to me. Um, so the problem, I reckon, for them is sure, if they can engineer the match up on Norton and that's how it runs, he's good enough now to beat Norton one on one, and we don't worry about it. We got Petty to zone off. So um, for me, he's it, it's just too simplistic um, to think you know stop Lever and you stop Melbourne. Um, and I, I think he's added so many strings to his bows, not least of which that um, number I couldn't believe when I read it eighth in total contested marks. That's that's fantastic. So um, he's a gun, um, and I think there's certainly no no discussion anymore about what we gave up for um, for bringing him into the footy club. Uh, no, we uh, we cancelled all discussion on that a number of weeks ago, so let us never talk of it again. <laughs> uh, George, uh, you'll be tackling uh, Bulldogs ball magnet uh, Jack uh, McRae and the silky smooth uh, defender. Well, you've already spoke about the silky smooth defender, Christian Salem, so uh, take it away uh, with uh, Jack McRae. Yeah, I've got a common theme tonight, uh, and the same applies to both of these players. Uh, uh, Brownlow vote free zones for both yeah. of them. Um, it is just incredible when when you look at both of these players who are so highly talented, high, highly elite disposers of the ball, uh, how unrecognised they, they are by, um, within the Brownlow. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of it. McRae um, this year broke the all-time record for the most disposals in the season. And yet he finishes up with 14 Brownlow votes. Uh, he actually has uh, a higher average number of disposals per game at 34 uh, with 4.8 tackles per game than what Ollie Wines, who won the Brownlow, who only has 32 and 4.4 and tackles per game. So 
I, I, I don't have yeah. any stats on it, but how damaging is he? Is he a bit like the Tom Mitchell who racks up possessions, no. but then we say, oh, well, he wasn't that. Uh, no, he's he's, he's far more damaging. Um, you know, you've, your Mitchells and, and even a Sam Walsh um, uh, get lots and lots of possessions, but uh, McRae is lethal with his boot, absolutely lethal. He, he's the one one player I'd, I'd love to have in the, the Demon side uh, currently playing in the Bulldogs. He just, every game he does the same thing. He just racks up those possessions, does his job, you don't notice him, and at the end of the game you go, hang on, he's had 32 possessions, I didn't really notice him. It's because he's putting the ball down someone else's throat um, all the time. He's just a brilliant kick. Um, fantastic to watch. Really dangerous. Um, so... Um, the only the, the only downside to his game uh, is that, and they probably depend on others more to do this. That he's only kicked six goals for the whole season, so he's when he's got the ball, he's giving it to others to do the damage in in front of goals. Um, but in terms of of getting it down to the other end of the ground, which we've talked about, he is absolutely critical. The ball comes out from the Liberatore. Um, uh, sort of scenario, it goes to the outside, it's Jack McRae's who are the ones who are delivering it up forward, or it gets into the bottom pally hand, so um, he's he's critical to their structure. Salem, in a similar way, um, he's, he's just that lethal kick, uh, and lethal user of the ball. Uh, elite disposals, he averages 25 disposals a game as an average, you know, from a guy who's playing on the half-back flank. Um, that, that's getting up to the levels of, of uh, some of the midfielders in the competition. So we've talked about him. I just love his high football IQ. I love the way that he is able to do things with the ball simply because he sees uh, opportunities that others don't and he's capable of delivering it. So um, uh, with with Salem, we've got... Uh, the, the basis of a uh, of the attack that comes up the up the up the ground, um, but that's that's the same for McRae as well, just in different areas of the ground. So they're a little bit unheralded. Unheralded. They're a lot unheralded, unfortunately, as in terms of the umpires um, in Brownlow votes. But um, they're both brilliant footballers to watch when they're playing. I could not agree more on um, McRae. I, I, I'm amazed how little... I mean, people know he's a good footballer and he gets talked about as a good footballer. Um, but I, you're spot on. I mean, he's for me, he's in the top four or five footballers in the AFL. And um, just some of the numbers on his uh, rankings this year, he's... And they're a bit sort of contradictory because he's tenth in contested possessions per game. If you you know you you wouldn't think that, would you? Just the way because he's a silky sort of mover. Um, he's second in effective disposals per game. He's ninth in center clearances per game. He's second in total goal assists, which is your point, George, about his sort of and also Andy that question about how damaging he is. They rely a lot on him, you know, winning that ball at the at the coal face, and he, he wins his share of his own ball, as, as indicated by his centre clearances. Um, uh, and but you get it out to him, and he he'll hurt you going inside fifty. Second in total handballs, um, first in the AFL fantasy. He's to, you know total uncontested number one. He's third in total clearances. I mean, they're incredible numbers. They're just incredible numbers, and he's a lock for all Australian every year. So yeah, I totally agree, George. It's amazing how under rated he is and he's just a beautiful kick of the footy so for him for me McRae and Daniels are I think the two best kicks in the AFL and the dogs they're the two players I'd take from the dogs if I could well obviously probably Bontempelli but I have McRae not far behind Bontempelli and maybe even close to being equal he's just a star I mean, he's had nearly uh 200 more disposals than Bontempelli um when you have a look at their stats, yet Bontebelli's had 33 votes in the Brownlow and uh, he's had 14. So that nearly, uh, you know. Yeah, it's just incredible. Any less uh, votes. And they won't do much work on him because it's sort of a bit, again, we've talked about it a number of times. How do you do that? Like, yeah, they'll, they'll look to limit his, the, impact so reduce you know his goal assist to and again it goes back to what george said it's all about the pressure so it doesn't matter how good a player is you'll hit more targets under pressure than someone with a who's an average kick um but you know we 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 have to have lots of frontal pressure so he looks up and he's got someone coming at him um and you know they don't like i heard this during the week someone say it sort of sounded funny but they don't like kicking over 
um, players. They like to chain it out and get it outside and then go around. Um, so you, 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 we've got to bring players up to that contest to force him to not have time and space. You give him time and space and, um, and Daniels for that matter and, and Bond, I guess, too, But uh, and they'll hurt you big time. All right, uh, we'll move on to my players and I'll be examining Bulldog's heartthrob with the luscious head of hair, uh, Bailey Smith, and Demon Livewire, Cozzy Pickett. Uh, for me, Bailey Smith, uh, he's, and I know, B-Man, you reckon he's a bit of a cheat, but he is one of the players I'm most worried about in terms of the damage that they could potentially inflict on us. I can't really identify anyone uh that we might match up on him. Uh, I don't think we'll actually sit someone on him as we don't tend to employ that type of tactic, especially as he's not technically a midfielder or, or even a small crafty forward. He seems to relish finals footy. Uh, pre-finals, he had only had uh, nine goals, 12 to his name uh, for the season, but he's uh, added um, eight goals in the finals with one, three and four goals. So he's had seven in the last two matches. Uh, during the year, he's only averaging 23 possessions a match and he's kept that up during the finals. Um, he's really been damaging to the opposition during this finals campaign and he's one that I feel could get off the chain and wreak havoc. Uh, do you think we should spend any time on him, uh, Bim Man? I know you think he's a bit of a cheat, but those cheats can hurt you. Oh, I, I mean, I think we'll spend time on all ev- everyone. Like, I don't think, you know... He's, uh, they remind me in some ways of what we've talked about, Port. They're a team that really thrives on energy. He's an energy player. Yep. Um, he's, you know, like you've got to run him up the, the ground, keep it away from their forward line by trapping it in hours, if yeah. that makes sense. Uh, again, it's a time and space thing. You take away his time and space. I'm not, I mean, I'm probably being a bit harsh on him. He's, he's had a good final period, but um, he's the sort of player that um, is – I think there's, it's easy to overrate him. Um, I, I, you know, I wonder whether there's all this talk about the benefit of um, of the break, of break for them, and I wonder whether it stopped their um, sort of momentum a little bit. Mm. He has just played Port. They put no pressure on him. He's yeah, going to yeah. come up against us, and he's going to have players like Viney, like Sparrow, like you know, whoever coming at him hard and putting him to ground right through, right from the get-go. Um, I, I wonder whether initially I had a thought that maybe they could run harms with him f- to be physical with him. Um, and, you know, but I just don't think that it, it's not their MO. It's not good his MO. So, but, you know, they'll put time into him. And, and to be honest, I think they'll look to to tackle him hard and, to, you know, fairly and um, be physical with him because Port gave him so much time in sp- time and space inside 50. Um, and so, you know, for me, it just doesn't work hard enough defensively if they're on the um, front foot and doing well it won't matter will it but um, you know it's a bit like keeping him out of the game so you know I don't think I don't think we'll put any work into him as such except having a focus and, and I wouldn't mind betting a bit of focus on some really sort of heavy ta- tackles and hits um, and sort of take the edge off him a bit Totally agree there, Bin Man. Um, I, I saw some highlights of the Port Dogs game uh, from one of the commentators, and they highlighted Smith and also Hannon uh, the complete lack of any pressure whatsoever. They they were picking the ball up sort of around about the middle of the field as from whatever play they they had initiated. But Smith and and Hannon were allowed to run half the length of the ground into the forward line before they kicked goals, and there was not a single Port player on either of them. Uh, it was just incredible. They just won't get away with that with us. It's as simple as that. We won't we won't put a player specifically on him. He they just won't get away with uh, that unpressured free running, which makes look looks fantastic from the spectators' point of view. But this is serious. This is the grand final. Uh, pressure levels go up uh, and, and I don't think you'll see the same sort of output from both of those players in this game. And I reckon that's a big factor why they've dropped off the dogs because the zone um, defence that we've got, as we've talked about all through the season, it's not just a zone about we're going to guard grass. It's their ability to move across and deny space to run into. So if you compare the, when we played them last year, they had so much space to run into. And a player like him, McRae as well for that matter, you know, and Daniels, as I mentioned before, they love it. You know, exactly as say, George, run the ball for 20 metres, plenty of time to choose your option, you know, 
But the way we, even when we're not playing that well, our defensive system's so strong ahead of the um, ball is that, you know, they look up, there's no space to run into. So he's forced to make a decision. Um, so he's kicking on the wing to the half forward line as opposed to kicking from the half forward line into goal. Um, so, yeah, I think that, yeah, that I, I can see him sort of really looking to limit his influence, but more by just how we play rather than targeting yeah, him more. Agreed. Um, let's move on. Cosy Pickett, likewise, a player that's built for finals footy uh, with 40 goals, 28 this year. He has proved that he can regularly hit the scoreboard and inflict damage. He's past three weeks. We've seen him kick three, two and three goals from admittedly not high possession counts of 14, 7 and 13. Uh, Cosy's other strength that he brings to the table is his pressure in the form of tackling and pressure acts, and which has been a staple of all of our small forwards uh, this year. Uh, if he can hit the scoreboard two, three, four times, then we're well on our way to winning games of football. Uh, for Cozzy, it's always good for him to get one one early, I find, get him into the game. Um, you know, And there's been comparisons of him with uh, Cyril. And when you have a look at their goal tallies in just their second year uh, of, of footy, Cyril's kicked 21 uh, whereas we just mentioned earlier, uh, Cozzy's kicked 40 this year. And for comparisons with some other fo- small forwards, the Wiz kicked 37 in his second year and Eddie Betts kicked 20 in his second year. So Cozzy with 40 uh, in his second year is just a phenomenal effort and I've, we've got plenty of years ahead of some great football with him. But uh, he's one that could really get off the chain in a grand final um, and kick a bag and... I don't think we've seen him kick a big bag, and I'm talking five goal plus. Love it to happen in a grand final. Uh, what do you reckon, boys? I reckon Andy's getting excited now. <laughs> it's gonna... I reckon the lid's almost off. It's, about... yeah, yeah. it's good. It's good. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, remember last time in uh, remember in the podcast last year we were um, you know in the middle part of the season when we were in struggle town and um, you know I, I reckon it's really good to look back last year is that we got going at the end of the season Cairns was obviously a horror show but you know we were really getting going and I remember the three of us talking about um, you know, Cosy had four or five possessions this particular game, uh, and all three of us were talking about. Well, in fact, maybe it was George and I, and Andy. We were saying he's got to kick goals for a small forward. <laughs> now that I think back to it, it's um, was the pressure he brings. He was the only one in that match applying inside fifty pressure, and I forget who uh, it was against. Um, and you know, that's really his he, goals. He kicks a total icing on the cake. Um, it's all about that pressure that he brings. Uh, and I think he's a smart footballer who's learnt to sort of um, rein his sort of um, energy in a little bit. So one of the things I've really loved how he, he tackle, if you watch him after the ball's released, he'll always put a hit on, but he does it fair. And I don't think he's given away um, after the, um, you know, down the ground free this year as he, he, he did last about year. half a dozen last yeah. year. So. Um, and he hits to he hits to hurt too. Like he hits, comes in with a rugby style sort of drop of the shoulder often. Um, he's clever. Uh, he's always putting pressure on them. And uh, I saw some footage of him. Um, I was watching the sort of another player in the, the footage. He's always on the move. So like how, how do they match up on him? What do they do? He's, he's too far. Like you can't just stop him. Um, and I, I reckon a major advantage for us, to their forward line is that Waitman, I think, is another player who's, um, you know, perhaps I'm being a bit unfair on the dogs, but I reckon he's overrated as well. He does not have the same ability to pressure that uh, he's, you know, he does a bit, but nowhere near Cozzy's level of pressure. Um, and, and I think it, it's a problem for them up forward. Our ground ball gets a massive, they were massive against Geelong and he's a huge part of it. Um, I'm just having a look at uh, Cozzy last year. He um, sort of averaged seven, uh, 7.7 7, uh, possessions a game. Uh, and this year he's averaging um, he's averaging 12. So he's lifted that. But uh, look at his goal output. Uh, he's kicked 40 goals this year. Only kicked seven from the 14 games last year. So we're getting and only scored goals in five five of the 14 games last year, and he's almost kicked a goal in every game, only a handful of games where he didn't uh, hit the scoreboard. Um, I think there's it's not a handful, he's three games where he didn't kick a goal this year. Um, so he's had a fantastic um, second, second year. 
and he's um, he's changed his um, kicking technique for goal. He's stopped that stupid skipping. Yep. Um, and he, I reckon he's, uh, I don't know what the numbers are. You probably know, Andy, but he's, he, it's, um, my sense is his accuracy has improved in the last half of the season. Well, he was, uh, I don't, I can't break it up just on the fly there, but uh, he's kicked 40 goals, 28 this year, and it was 7-13 last year, but I didn't kick many last year. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, it seems that he's just having a look. It seems, yeah, he, he is uh, – his conversion rate looks a lot better. Like he was 2-2, two, 4-1, two, 1-2, 2-3, 1-2, 3-2, and then later in the year he's 3-1, 2-1, 2-1, 2-2, 2-1. So, he's, yeah, his conversion rate's a, a lot better. Um, let's let's move on. Uh, B-Man, you are going to take us through the bulldog strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you've ever covered some things already, you don't yeah. have to go over them again. But uh, if there's anything else that sort of stands out and you want to bring it to the table. Uh, yeah, yeah, I probably have covered most of them. I mean, their strength, um, you know, of all the teams in the, in the AFL, I think they're, um, you know, they've got the best list outside of the Ds. Um, and they've, they've got stars on every line. Um, they've got a great coach. Um, I think they've got a game plan that they all know, but, um, you know, it's a bit like I said about the Cats, not quite as as dramatic. Their strengths are close to their weaknesses. Um, and, you know, for me, their their strength is their ability to, to move the ball, um, uh, their ability to move it outside of to win contests, uh, to win stoppages in particular, and to get it out to those those players that's well drilled they've been doing that since 2016 you know they they are a team that thrive on that chaos chaos ball um that's what they brought to the game in 2016 i, I think they they when when the history books are written they'll be um credited a lot for bringing that sort of chaos running in waves style that you know that we're we're playing with a bit of that spirit and certainly Richmond picked up that mantle and ran with that's definitely strength I mean you mentioned Bontempelli he's a a, you know he's as good a footballer as I can recall seeing for you know ever basically Um, they've got McRae as we talked about it right through all of their lines they've got stars Um, I think their weaknesses is their game plan a bit in the big pressure and I said that right back before when we're previewing round 11 I was really looking forward to that game because for me the weakness is a game plan that revolves uh, around scores scores from stoppages means the obvious thing is you can stop them soaring from stoppages where to next for them Um, whereas you know for instance that's a you know a hard thing to take away our strength which George will speak to in a sec so for me that's a really big weakness coming in now uh, you know it's really interesting because their ability to win stoppages was lauded and it was really interesting philosophically um about the way beverage has always said we don't need a ruckman essentially so even in 2016 boyd wasn't really a ruckman as such or i mean obviously played a key role in that in that win um but they stuck to their guns right through the season it come finals time they've brought back martin that's a really interesting admission that they've got a um a, a problem with the stoppages they're not going to win stoppages to the same degree as us because of how strong our midfield wolves are so we instantly negate that you can cover off daniels even if they bring up williams bailey williams to the contest you can cover off him as well um so i think that's a real problem for them and you know it's, i think it's a problem for them they've got keith coming into the grand final who's underdone he played on um um fritch last time in round 19 which i didn't realize i'd forgotten about when i watched the replay he was on him and i wonder whether that was because of his hamstring and they were worried about how's he going to go with brown and or mcdonald he's just not going to be able to run up and down the ground he hasn't been doing any or limited running because of his hamstring they've got martin who's definitely underdone so they've got two key players a key position defender in their ruckman who um, is physically underdone um, and i reckon there's a question mark on bont so you know those things are a bit of a problem for them, I would have thought. Um, and, you know, we haven't got any injury uh, worries outside May, who seems to be fine. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I've probably touched on the other strengths and weaknesses before, but they're the key ones, I think. Uh, George, you want to uh, take a – you've been tasked with uh, analysing the Ds, uh, their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, take it away. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it goes without saying one of our biggest strengths is our defence and it's completely different like I was saying before about than the Bulldogs defence. Ours is really highly structured. Um, we've got plenty of backups in each line on the defence. Uh, uh, 
they work together so well and they've worked together so well over the whole season. They've been uh, playing together. They understand each other. Um, it's a complete structure that operates down there and the fact that we've got the best defence in the league has, has been proven over the whole season. But we've also added another string in the sense that we've got uh, a high, highly rebounding capability now from our defensive lines. Um Bowie has been a, a, a fantastic addition to the team. So with Bowie and Salem and Rivers coming off that half-back line, um, there there's really isn't a weakness um, without throughout that whole structure. And I think the strength uh, that falls to the Demons is that's so much better than what the Bulldogs have got uh, as a forward line. They, they depend on different ways to get their goals, but our defence will hold up very strongly against them for the whole, for the whole game. Uh, more importantly, we've got we've got more options and less problems to counter the do- uh, to counter the dogs' um, uh, attacks forward. The other the other um, main strength that we've got is the rucks. Um, I think this goes without saying. Um, Max Gorn is the best in the game at the moment, all Australian. Jackson as a back backup is completely enigmatic. He's something special. He is that unicorn that comes along every now and then could do anything in a in a grand final. More importantly, we don't lose anything when uh, Jackson comes into the rucks, and I think that's what uh, the Bulldogs are really going to struggle. Uh, they put, they've brought um, Martin back in as a stopgap measure, I think, uh, more than anything else, knowing that uh, they're going to have to come up. Uh, Against uh, a couple of decent rucks in the certainly in the preliminary and possibly the grand final, but Martin's giving away four inches to Gorn in the old standards, um, so he's short for a start. He is definitely injured. He could barely um, uh, get up a, a walk off the ground um, at the end of their preliminary final. Uh, English Gorn, if Gorn comes up up against English. Uh, he will absolutely monster him physically, um, and for both of them, Gorn will run them off their feet. But so will Jackson. Jackson's highly athletic, and the other thing that Jackson brings is his ability to get clearances. He's he's not just a ruckman who knocks the ball to the ground for others to get. If he 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 reads the ball so well, he contributes to the plays. He provides backups uh, to the other mids as well. So, uh, but Gorn at the moment, if Gorn plays anywhere like half the game that he played um, in his previous match, particularly in that third quarter. Um, the game, once again, the game is all over. He could win the game singly off his own bat. The only weaknesses I think um, that we've got, and we've got, I'm not saying this as, as a you know, hard died in the, died in the wool um, demon supporter, but their only weakness that I can see we've got strengths across all the lines. Um, we can match the Bulldogs in pretty well every area. We've got these couple of definite advantages. And the only weakness I've seen for the whole season effectively is is the goal kicking. Um, if we kick straight, we win the match. It's as simple as that. Even though, and it was proven in the um, round 11 match versus the round 19 match. If we kick straight, particularly if we kick straight early, uh, we're going to have a very good day. Um Another slight one is the pressure, and I suspect when we've dropped the pressure off, it might have been due to uh, during the season. It might have been during uh, due to training loads, as we suspect. But we need to bring the pressure into this game. It cuts out the bulldogs. One would, as Ben Man des- describes it, put them under pressure, get their kicks going where they don't want them to, or or not exactly where they want them to, and they're going to struggle. We'll intercept and, and rebound very quickly. So if we bring the pressure early that we've seen so well, particularly in the preliminary final, we once again, we will take away their, their one wood and they just won't have any uh, uh, second options effectively in the game. So um, I'd... Can't say anything else, and it's nice to have only those small amounts of weaknesses, but um, let's hope Fritter kicks his first one and, and we'll be well on our way. Just to, uh, only sort of weakness, I mean, to add, I reckon, is, I guess, a strength or um, I'm not sure if it's a strength or a you know, for the dogs, but their experience. They've got 11 players who played in the um, 2016 grand final 
we've only got Lever who um, you know who's played in the grand final. So um, you know that's been brought up as a, a benefit, obviously, for the dogs. Is that a weakness? I'm not sure. I mean, what can you do about it? But we've risen to every occasion so far. Um, so you know that's something there. Um, the other thing I think, George, as you pointed out, like the it's a strength for us and it's a real problem for them is that, you know, the talk about obviously in footy is you want to score more than the opposition. That's a, that's a given. Um, but our defence is so effective that they're going to have to keep us to 70 points or 75 points mm. to win the game. That's a, that's a big problem because, you know, ordinarily you go, all right, well, we're going to win 100 points. You go out and that's the sort of benchmark. We'll be aiming for that too, obviously. But we flip it. You've got to be able. Their defence is going to have to somehow stop us scoring. I reckon seventy points. If they don't get, if we if we kick more than seventy points, we'll win because we're not giving up. We're averaging what something like sixty points. Is it Andy for the season? Something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, teams don't score against us. So um, Brisbane are the highest scoring team in the AFL. Second is Geelong. Neither of them could score more than seven goals against us. So, you know, um, I think that's a big problem. It's obviously a massive strength for us. But it's a massive um, issue for the Bulldogs because, you know, of course they've got to score, um, but they've got to keep us to um, 70 points. That's exactly right, yeah. And, and I think that's the, the real wash-up. They've got more problems than what we have. Yeah. But you've got to kick straight. That's been a, a, an issue for us all year. Um, and, uh, yeah, got to kick them early. That's the – get it out of uh, – out the yips out of the heads. Uh, let's move on to the coaching and game plans. Uh, reading social media this week, a lot of pundits who are tipping the Bulldogs to win are invariably pointing to the fact that they reckon that Luke Beveridge is a tactical genius and the second coming of Jock McHale, Norm Smith, Kevin Sheedy, Lee Matthews and Alistair Clarkson all rolled into one. And I don't think Goody and his team of Uze, Chaplin, Choco and Co are getting enough credit – for our season, from you know, from some, especially outside of uh, the D's and and uh, you know, from Demon fans, uh, B man, how do you see coaching and game plan of the teams playing out? Do you think Beveridge might pull a rabbit out of the hat in, at selection, like doing a, a Jamar Eugle Hagen, uh, bringing uh-huh. him back? Look, I doubt it. I wouldn't if I mean already, as I said, the you know Keith. Martin and potentially Bontempelli. That's, you know, what's the old rule about not playing injured players in the big games? I think you're into, finals? you mean Waitman? Uh, uh, Dustin no, no, Martin's not playing no. for them either. Oh, uh, no, Steph well, Martin. Keith is coming back from his hammy. Yeah. He's already done two this season. Um, it was really curious that they played him on um, Fritch. Um, you know, surely he takes um, one of McDonald or Brown. Um, Martin, I mean, they've got three players who are not at optimum fit, and that's not even counting Waitman, who's coming back from, I guess, concussion. He, he should be fine. Um, well, hopefully, for his sake, he's fine. Um, just going backwards one step in terms of your point about accuracy, I, one of the, their strengths all season um, has been, uh, one of the dog's strengths all seasons has been um, scoring early and, and great first quarters. And that has been a weakness for us at different times. Times, but not in the last six weeks. Um, we've been dynamite in the last, or particularly in the two finals. Uh, we jumped uh, the Lions and we jumped um, uh, the Cats, obviously. Accuracy was important, but it was also our physical pressure and our intensity. Um, now, they jumped um, Port Adelaide, but you know, I, I just think the two games were completely different. Port Adelaide were, were limp. Um, and, and and I think it's actually a bad preparation for them because whatever happens, we know, all three of us know that it's, you know, we, we may have nerves at the beginning of the game. We might have, we may not, we might miss shots. That's every chance, you know, that's what happens in big games. I guess what we... 100% won't happen is we won't come out like Port. We will come out like fierce Tigers and we will smash them. Um, and so I think the, that first quarter is really going to be where the game's won and lost. And George has you know, pointed that out before. If we're shutting, if we bring that pressure, I can't see how they work their way through it. I, you know, I, I reckon Goody be loving all of this um, beverage is a tactical guru stuff. Um, and it speaks to me, the sort of narrative a bit is a bit like, they're plugging holes all over the place. Like he's got to work some magic to come up against us. And for me, it's sort of this, you know, the, the D's would be happy with it. But it sort of, again, it downplays how good we are, actually, I think. And it's sort of, you know, everyone talks about our defence, like that's the only part of our game. Goody's not going to say anything to the contrary. But I, I don't know about you guys. It's been remarkable how 
um, confident Goody has been. If you take away, he's he's not really a ranter and raver, but he's you know he's been very positive in the way he's talking about our chances. Um, so you know, w- will Beveridge bring um, a wild card? I wouldn't have thought he's they, they can. If I mean, I'd love for them to do something like that um, because you know to me that's a sign of desperation, not uh, of confidence. And to be honest, a lot of the messaging out of there, you know, this whole us against them narrative, surely that you know, surely that's got a limit. Um, and I think that limit will be found out, um, you know, at 7.15 Eastern Standard Time on Saturday night when we smash into them in that first quarter. So, you know, in terms of the game plan, um, you know, one of the things that I love about Goody uh, and his time at the club is if we go back to 2017, you know, on Demon Land, people, it was a joke. It was a running joke about, you know, this idea of that he said right from the beginning of his um, tenure as coach is that he wants to implement a game plan that is identifiable, that Melbourne fans can come along and know what to, they're going to get um, and will be proud of the boys' effort and if nothing else, they'll get the effort week in, week out and we're there. That's exactly what we've got. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of stats the way we play. We've talked about it all season. We've talked about it tonight. Um, for me, the one stat, you know, there's a lot of useless stats. The the big one is, you know, we've talked about it's, that argument's one, clearances aren't the the number. It's post clearances. We're number one in the AFL in post clearance. Um, better than, than the Bulldogs. Um, the big one the big stat that is still got currency, I reckon, um, is um, contested footy. Uh, we were plus 25, I think, or plus 22 against the Cats, similar against the uh, Lions. We were up, way up contested possessions after the first quarter. Um, you know, we're number one contested ball by a mile. Uh, I think, I can't recall whether the Dogs are second or they might be third. Um, so for me, if we win the contested ball, we'll win this game of footy. Um, so there's all of the tactics stuff around that you know it would be really interesting to see early on whether they bring an extra match the extra that the dogs bring to the stoppage i don't think they will i think they'll tag uh liver um you go back to what worked in round 11 round 11 is the template um deny them time and space not allow them to switch force them to kick down the line win the ball back you know the whole sort of model for the demons um is winning the ball back and bringing it back in um unlike the dogs who like to get it out in space win at the stoppages um you know we take that away from them with our bulls and get forward to the center um you know for me in that in those stoppages key to to dismantling their strength i guess is exactly what george said before uh and and i can't sort of I think the most important player on the ground will be Max because his ability to combine with Jackson and and how they tactically sort of shift that around, he is the ace in our pack to win those stoppages. Um, So we we don't even have to win clearances against them. We only have to break even and that takes away their way of scoring. Um, There's no way really that they've got to take away our way of scoring, which is high pressure, trap it forward. The only way that they can do that is to match our pressure. And I think that we've shown, you know, we've shown with our contested ball that no one brings the heat like the D's do. Um, and, I, and for me, that's the game. We bring the heat exactly like George says before. Forget all the tactics and the genius of beverage. If we bring the heat, we win this game of footy. Um. Just while we're talking about Goodwin, uh, congratulations to to Simon Goodwin. He was the recipient of this year's um, AFL uh, Coaches Association Senior Coach of the Year Award. So a nice feather in the cap for for him and hopefully he can cap it off with a a premiership medallion as well. Um, George, did you want to add anything to uh, the tactics? No, no, that uh, bin man summed it all up. It is all about the pressure and and, uh, those critical aces like Max Gorn, but it, it is all about the pressure. We bring the pressure, it takes them apart. It's as simple as that. They don't won't have any response to it. And the, the thing about that model that we've built is that it's pressure resistant. So because they're so well drilled in it, they all know where each other's supposed to be. All of that pointing, all of that training, four or five years, this isn't a one-season thing. This is a, since 2017 and probably before that, right back to when Ruzi came in and said, defence first, let's stop them scoring, through to now. This is a journey of six, seven years. Um, and that's why the sort of the model, that's the model he's been talking about, a model that stands up in finals. Um, so even when they they get momentum, that's why that's – been a secret to our success this year. Even when the opposition get momentum, and at some point the dogs 100% will, 
they can't take advantage of it fully. So, you know, remember the Lions had that patch. They could only score two goals. The Cats had 10 minutes in the, um, was it the second quarter? Um, they could only score two or three or two goals in that, that that patch of footy. It's been the theme right through the season. Teams can't get a hold of us, which is why that round 23 um, burst of goals was such an outlier, wasn't it? It was like, whoa, this is such a shock because all season, no one, you know, they're probably the only team that has been able to score against us and break us down all season was Adelaide in that um, the game the, the first game we played against them. Uh, Optus Stadium uh, for the first time in uh, VFL AFL history. The grand final is being played in Perth, and it's only the second time uh, it's going to be played outside of Victoria. The D's have been based in Perth and out of quarantine for a lot longer than the doggies, as we mentioned. Uh, doggies were shipped all over the country over the past month. Uh, can you guys see any of the teams uh, having that advantage? It looks like we've got a bit of the advantage of playing in Perth and in particular at Optus Stadium. Uh, team, we've had a couple of games there now. Um, we spoke to Purdy last night and he, he talked about how we've, uh, we've, you know, we chose to go to Perth and that was why it was so important that we finished top so we would have sort of that choice because we knew we'd have to get out of, out of Dodge in Victoria and, and move and we've, we based ourselves in Perth, had to play the first final in Adelaide but since then uh, we've spent sort of time in one place so we've been a lot more settled. Uh, uh, George, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think you've summed it up, all up. Um, uh, Purdy was quite adamant in that in- interview about the advantage that we had by being in, in Perth, the access to Optus Stadium, yep. um, having played a game there. And I think the only other real advantage that's perhaps not known as I suspect um, that we will have a superior number of supporters at the ground um, cheering us on as opposed to the dogs. So... Uh, uh, it's exactly it's set up perfectly for us more so than them. But at the end of the day, the, you know these are the top two play uh, teams in the competition as far as I'm concerned. I think it'll be um, there won't be any real advantage um, from playing necessarily on that ground. There might be bits at the edge, but not much more. Yeah, I, I tend to think that it actually is quite an advantage to us, George, in the sense that. Our model is built for the G and it's like you talked about last week uh, or the week before and around the dimensions of um, the ground is that it really the space of the Optus Oval um, ups our comparative advantage in terms of our defensive system. And, you know, I can't get away from the fact that um, Martin will be tailing Max all day. Max will use that space and run him into the ground. Um, Keith, similarly, will have to chase Brown and McDonald up the ground or even if Fritch gets up the ground as well, if he ends up being on Fritch again. Bontempelli, if he's not 100%, forces players like Bailey Smith, if he wants to get back in defence, well, he's going to have to, and he'll be gas running back into getting the forward line. I think our superior fitness um, and our game plan is a major advantage to um, playing at Optus Oval, and that's even leaving aside our familiarity with it and the fact that they've clearly made it sort of psychologically a home ground um, as well. So I think that's another big um, tick for us. Uh, the weather will report. Bin Man, you've been keeping a keen eye on the weather over in Perth. What can we expect in terms of conditions? Well, it gets better and better, uh, the weather. I've been watching it now for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only concern is that there's rain forecast for Sunday, so let's hope that front doesn't move in too quick. So, um, But for Saturday, the forecast um, is uh, maximum 27 during the day chance of rain 5% which is basically their way of saying no rain becoming cloudy which is perfect which means there will be no dew on the ground Um, so cloudy during the afternoon the wind's a bit strong in the afternoon but it's becoming light during the evening which is perfect for us Um, so for a 5.15 is it 5.15 start western in Perth uh, that should be absolutely brilliant conditions and that stadium is that stadium's quite enclosed as well. It's got a real um, uh, sort of gladiator stadium type feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think perfect conditions for us. Um, that was a big advantage, you know, as we talked about after the round 19. I would be worried a bit if um, if we were playing in the wet because they're, they're better kickers. Um, I think suits, you know, the, the, the skills come out um, when it's wet. So perfect conditions. Um, changes. I'm assuming everyone is healthy as of the recording of this podcast, including Stephen May. 
Uh, do you envision us making any changes for the grand final? Who's going to be the medical sub? I guess I'll ask two questions. Uh, what changes, if any, uh, would you uh, make for the grand final? And then what changes, if any, do you think the club will actually make? So I want to get your opinion on who you think should be playing, if, um, you know, what changes, if any, and then what, what we'll actually do, because that can be two different things. Uh, B-Man, you want to start? What I would do? Um, only because I love him in the team um, and so this is a bad reason to bring him in. Um, but I'd love to see Hunt come in for Hibbert. Uh, no knock on Hibbert. I just think Hunt's been there for the long um, haul. I love the way he's playing his footy this year. Um, desperately unlucky to get injured when he did. As we mentioned when we were going through that flat patch, it was only him and Nibbler who had improved his player ratings, um, AFL player ratings between about round 11 and round 15, which was super important. Um, you know, I remember that GWS game. That was one of the handful of games I saw live, and he got some criticism for that game. But I thought he was great. He was the only one, you know, giving that overlap run. To me, it would be quite an aggressive decision to bring him in because he does provide that overlap run. Um, Hibbert has lost a, um, um, a bit of pace. Um, what they will do is that I can't see them making a change because, one, it's been Goodwin's philosophy all season not to make change. Um, I think Jordan will be the Medi sub. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think that he's shown such faith in his players. He, he's been pretty consistent too with the way he's talked about that. He's not the sort of player to, to um, throw out a sort of or just sort of coach to bring in someone totally random. And I think, I mean, maybe Smith, but you know, I don't think if we're playing Port, I reckon they would have brought potentially Smith in to take a Marshall or as an extra tall. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think with Bruce not in the side, it means that that's not really. Um, um, needed. So I think they'll um, stick with Hibbard and I wouldn't mind betting that Hibbard ends up um, going head to head with Waitman and physically just sort of shows him this is AFL footy young fella um, because he's sort of similar in some ways Waitman, maybe quicker obviously than Papley but um, he, he manned up, he matched up really well against Papley, Hibbard. Um, so I, I, I'd probably see no change with Hibbard um, going shoulder to shoulder with Waitman for much of the game. George, same questions to you. Yeah, similar sorts of answers as well. I, th- I think it's going to. I don't think we're going to see Smith. This is his uh, third week uh, back from the uh, hamstring injury, um, so he's going to be, let's call it marginal. Um, I d- don't think there's any doubt about Hunt. He's had that, that extra week, so he's he's available. Um, May has overcome his. Uh, problem looking at the training vi- uh, video and the same for Charlie Spargo. Charlie didn't even have uh, strapping on his ankle today that he did two days ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree. It's going to come down to the Hibbert or Hunt. And I suspect it might be uh, more about, from the coach's perspective, about what the Bulldogs bring into their forward line. Um, if they don't, if the Bulldogs effectively don't make any change, I can see Hunt coming in because he provides us with something extra. But um, if if they're going to play uh, those extra tools down there, or um, maybe even the, the the advent of Waitman, I think Hibbert's got a more defensive mindset than what Hunt, Hunt has. So it's about the assessment that the coaches um, will make about what's needed on the day, sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, Hibbert or Hunt, um, six or one half dozen the other in a way. Both have got their advantages. Both have got some talents that are different. So um, coaches, once again, have got some very difficult decisions to make. Um, before we go into our the final part of the show tonight, we're going to do some predictions. Uh, but before we do that, there is an open training session on Friday at Optus Stadium. I believe the Demons will be – you have to buy tickets to it. So if you are in Perth and you're keen to go down, you do have to buy uh, tickets. I think there's 25,000 tickets available to view a training session of, of first the Ds and then the Bulldogs. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, I think it's time for interstate people, particularly the people from Perth and the people from Adelaide, uh, who are traveling over to Perth to, to go to the grand final. It's your time to repay, um, uh, people <laughs> like George, uh, who goes down to preseason training, couldn't obviously this year with COVID, but, uh, George, Satty, uh, and others I've been down before to give some training reports. Uh, so this is a perfect time for our, 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 
Western Australian listeners and members of Demon Land, South Australians, get down um, to training um, and give us a training report. We'd love, no doubt, the club will will cover it. But it's always nice to have a uh, have that uh, you know uh, sort of eye of a track watcher giving us uh, you know not not sugarcoating it. Uh, Except Andy, that's not the one you want to send Demon Landers to. <laughs> the one you want to send Demon Landers to is tomorrow. That's going to be the last big hit out, I understand, before the um, grand uh, final. Are you um, allowed to go to those sessions? I wasn't sure whether they're open or not. I don't know. I mean, I've, the talk I've heard is that it's there's a chain mesh bench that you can look through it, you know. So that's what people have had to do at Casey. So. All right, get down there, guys, and uh, give, yeah. us, give us a report. No excuse. Maybe Perth people don't like to travel the 40-odd kilometres up to Joondalup. I don't know. But time, it's, it's time for a play Casey, favor. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right, uh, prediction time, guys. Uh, Regular listeners to this podcast will be well aware that my uh, prescient abilities are pretty weak. Uh, My ladder predictions were a dismal failure uh, as we're coming into the home straight. And when it comes to footy tipping, my OCD and superstition had uh, me uh, successfully tipping against the Ds, even in matches that I knew we couldn't possibly lose. So I think it's best that I recuse myself from making an official prediction lest I offend anyone based on some psychological war games that I'm playing out in my own mind. Um, so I, I'm not going to make it. You have to make a tip. How can I'm I make a tip? How can I not uh, tip the I want the Ds to win. Like I, I can't say, look, oh, I, th- I actually think we're a very good chance to win. I, th- I don't often – I'm often very negative when it comes to Ds, but I, I recognise – We've got a ve- more so than any other grand final I've ever been to have I been confident. But I also know that the Bulldogs can just as easily win this game. As George mentioned, a very even even teams. And um, I do know we can win. I can envision in my head all the players getting up and accepting their medals and uh, Gorney lifting the cup. I can see that in my head. Uh, you know, uh, I couldn't say the same for 2000. Um, so, yeah, my confidence level is up. But, uh, yeah... Look, I'll pick the D's. D's are going to win. Oh, thank you. There we go, thank George. You. We've got it. Well, well that means <laughs> if it goes by my footy tipping, it just means I just did a the kiss first, of death. That's the first step is admitting you've got a problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you definitely have a problem. There's my issues run, run deep with this uh, scarring from this football club. Uh, we've got it on tape, Andy. You tip yeah. the D's. Oh, and, I'll, and we've now got someone to blame if we lose. Yeah, well, yeah, you <laughs> and you can blame Big Man for forcing my hand there. Um, <laughs> Big Man, give me uh, your predictions uh, uh, for the match. You, you also uh, you wanted to to not do take someone for the Norm Smith or yeah, I, look as being objective as possible and looking at it sort of as cold eyed and um, as a punter looking at it the lens that I would if I was looking at through that lens. Um, you know, our form, we've won the last six games. As I said, we've averaged north of 100 points. Um, you know, we're as fit as a list as we're ever going to have coming into a grand final. I believe we're the best team uh, in the AFL by a long way. I think we're underrated, if that makes sense. I think we'll, um, time will look back and go, right, OK, they were, a, they were a pretty good team. Why didn't we, we see this? I think that the Dogs um, have got um, a, a lot of sort of issues that they've got to overcome, whereas we're in, you know, um, brilliant space. Uh, I can't see us um, struggling with that idea of, you know, the break and the rust and all of that stuff. I just don't see that as a problem, partly because of, again, of our model. Like the model is is bomb proof in many ways. You just got to bring the heat. Um, I would be really disappointed if we don't bring the heat. If we lose the game, it'll be because the dogs play out of their skin. Um, and if they do and play at a level that beats us, then um, you know, whilst I'll be crushed and go into my shell for six months probably, um, then you know, all hats off to them. But I can't see that happening. I think the first quarter will be critical as it always is in big games. Um, I think that you know the way we'll play is to to match them at the contest, to win the contested ball, to stop their stoppage, make sure that we minimise the um, the um, scores from stoppage, um, and that we'll do what we've done to teams um, all season. We'll get on top um, and I wouldn't mind betting it goes much the same way as perhaps not the prelim but certainly the qualifying final um, so I'm predicting a 47 point Ooh. win where we're 30 points up at half time um, they come at us hard at three quarter three, at third quarter time we hold them and we kick away in the last quarter um, Norm Smith 
Um, I reckon there's some good opportunities there. <laughs> David King said during the week since 1990, no one under 190 centimetres has uh, won the um, uh, Norm Smith. <laughs> so I thought, well, that was that was good that he was earning his dollars there, counting that backwards, but I bet you he didn't come up with it. Um, Max, he's, you know, if, if you play something like prelim, he's going to win the Norm Smith because it was extraordinary, but I can't see it. So I think that, you know, if you were having a bet, you make money putting um, on track or uh, Oliver. They're just two perfect players, particularly I'd say track in terms of he's likely to kick goals. But the Smokey, I reckon, is really good value is Jack Viney. He's currently $21. Um, and he's the sort of player that um, is a huge chance to win um, a Norm Smith. He's a bit similar to Shuey, the way he plays in and under, aggressive in the face of the opposition. Uh, and the thing about the Norm Smith is it's decided on by a panel and the panel made up of ex-footballers and a handful of, I think it's four or five people, um, two journos usually and three ex-players. So they're watching it. He'll get his numbers so the journos will see his stats, but the ex-players love the sort of player that Jack Viney is. So um, I, I reckon he's a great chance at winning it. And at 21 bucks, he's a, a terrific value as well. All right. I now understand why betting companies make lots of money. So we've got uh, the Demons winning by 47 and Jack Viney as a $21 bet. So, okay. <laughs> um, however, similarly, I, I think uh, this weekend the Norm Smith curse will be uh, lifted for the club. Uh, I think it'll be a lot closer than what uh, Binman thinks. Uh, I'm, I'm giving the Ds by 12 uh, simply because uh, these are two highly talented clubs um, uh, and have been all year. So um, you got the two best sides playing off in the grand final. It should be a close match from, from what I can see. Um, once again, though, I, I think uh, Binman's right about uh, Petraka. Um, he's, the, he's the equivalent of our Dustin Martin. The grand final is built for exactly that sort of player who just takes the game by the throat like he did in the uh, preliminary final. Just takes it by the throat when needed and wins the game off his own boot if necessary. Um, Max's performance was fantastic, but nobody could stop Petrarca in that pre- preliminary final when the when the wood was when the game was even more evenly balanced. Um, he just took it apart and did what he wanted, and I think he'll do the same in this uh, game because I don't think the Bulldogs, even with their midfield, have got anyone who's capable of holding him. So, um, Petraka for the Norm Smith for me. Andy? Uh, my Norm Smith, I can't go past uh, Big Maxi. Sponsor the guy, um, followed his career from day one, and, you know, five All-Australians later, captain of the club, the only thing, the only two things that he's going to needs to add to that resume is a Premiership Cup and a Norm Smith. So I'm going to go for Big Maxi Gorn. Um, well, fellas, I think that's where we're going to end it tonight. It's been a monster show. We're nearly two and a half hours uh, of chatting about the D's. We will be back next week. I can't promise that we'll do a Monday night show uh, if we win. I'll probably get. I'll, I'll probably want to get on uh, as soon as possible. But if we lose, uh, that's a different story. It might take a few days, but we will cover the game. Uh, uh, you know, no matter what the result, uh, definitely we'll we'll be back to talk about it. Um, for those listening live, I'm going to play the uh, Gary Pert interview. It's another 45 minutes, so if you're still got legs to listen, have a listen. Otherwise, listen to it uh, at at a later date. You'll find it on all uh, the podcast uh, apps. Thank you to all of our uh, callers uh, to the show tonight. Thank you to uh, Bin Man. Thank you to George. Guys, I'm very excited. We've got three days, 20 hours, 18 minutes and 32 seconds to go. And I just cannot wait. Um, Good luck and go Demons. Go Red Legs.